Chapter One of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. Preface. I have for a long time intended the publication of this book, for I thought that such a work would not only be found interesting to the public, but would do justice to the brave men with whom it was my fortune to be associated during the dark hours of the rebellion. To serve them is and ever will be my greatest pleasure. The remarkable features and events of our late cavalry movements in Virginia and elsewhere, visible to me during the campaigns of the Army of the Potomac, were noted daily in my journal. From that diary the story of our raids, expeditions, and fights is compiled. My descriptions of battles and skirmishes, in some cases, may seem too brief and unsatisfactory to which I can only say that scores of engagements, which to the participants appear to be of vast importance, have very little general interest. On the other hand, however, it is to be regretted that where our gallant horsemen have done the most brilliant things, it has been impossible for me, in many instances, to secure reliable and detailed accounts with which to do them full justice. Willard Glazier New York, October 8, 1870 Chapter 1 The War for the Union, Contest Begun 1861, Enthusiasm of the North Washington Threatened Bull Run and Its Lessons General Scott and the Cavalry Enlistment under Captain Buell Harris Light Cavalry, Leaving Troy, New York, Captain A. N. Dufier, Drilling and Fencing at Scarsdale, New York, Bound for the Seat of War, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Camp Oregon. The 11th of April, 1861, revealed the real intention of the Southern people in their dastardly assault upon Fort Sumter. The thunder of rebel cannon shook the air not only around Charleston, but sent its thrilling vibrations to the remotest sections of the country, and was the precursor of a storm whose wrath no one anticipated. This shock of arms was like a fire alarm in our great cities, and the North arose in its might with a grand unanimity which the South did not expect. The spirit and principle of rebellion were so uncaused and unprovoked that scarcely could anyone be found at home or abroad to justify them. President Lincoln thereupon issued a call for 75,000 men to uphold and vindicate the authority of the government, and to prove, if possible, that secession was not only a heresy in doctrine, but an impracticability in the American Republic. The response to this call was much more general than the most sanguine had any reason to look for. The enthusiasm of the people was quite unbounded. Individuals encouraged individuals. Families aroused families. Communities vied with communities, and states strove with states. Who could be the first and do the most was the noble contention which everywhere prevailed. All political party lines seemed to be obliterated. Under this renovating and inspiring spirit, the work of raising the nucleus of the grandest army that ever swept a continent went bravely on. Regiments were rapidly organized and as rapidly as possible sent forward to the seat of government and so vast was the number that presented themselves for the country's defense that the original call was soon more than filled and the authorities found themselves unable to accept many organizations 
which were eager to press into the fray. Meanwhile, the great leaders of the rebellion were marshalling the hordes of treason, and assembling them on the plains of Manassas, with the undoubted intention of moving upon the national capital. This point determined the principal theatre of the opening contest, and around it on every side, and particularly southward, was to be the Acaldema of America, the dreadful field of blood. The first great impulse of the authorities was in the direction of self-defense, and what could be more natural and proper, and Washington was fortified and garrisoned. This done, it was believed that the accumulating forces of the Union, which had become thoroughly equipped and somewhat disciplined, ought to advance into the revolted territory, scatter the defiant hosts of the enemy, and put a speedy end to the slaveholders' rebellion. But the hesitation and indecision which prevailed in our military circles were becoming oppressive and unendurable, and hence the cry of On to Richmond was heard from the border states to the St. Lawrence, precipitating the first general engagement of the war. Our defeat at Bull Run was a totally unexpected disaster, which, for a time it was feared, would chill the enthusiasm and greatly weaken the energy of the North. But though the South was much strengthened and emboldened by their victory, our defeat had its own curative elements. It taught us that the enemy was determined and powerful, and that to overcome him the ranks of the Union Army must be filled with something besides three months' men, or men on any very limited term of enlistment. Other lessons were also gained. Our men had formed some acquaintance with the citizens and the country. They had learned the importance of a more thorough discipline and organization and those who had gone forth as to a picnic or a holiday sat down to count the cost of enduring hardness as good soldiers. The nation discovered that this struggle for life was desperate and even dubious, and it was thoroughly aroused. Under the military regime of General Winfield Scott, the cavalry arm of the service had been almost entirely overlooked. His previous campaigns in Mexico, which consisted mainly of the investments of walled cities and of assaults on fortresses, had not been favorable to extensive cavalry operations, and he was not disposed at so advanced an age in life materially to change his tactics of war. What few regiments of cavalry we had in the regular army were mostly broken up into small detachments for the purpose of ranging our western frontiers, while a few squads were patrolling between the outposts of our new army, carrying messages from camp to camp, and pompously escorting the commanding generals in their grand reviews and parades. But the Black Horse Cavalry of Virginia at Bull Run, unmatched by any similar force on our side, had demonstrated the efficiency and importance of this branch of the service, and our authorities began to change their views. The sentiment of the people at large seemed to turn in the same channel, and a peculiar enthusiasm in this direction was perceptible everywhere. It was as though the spirit of the old knight errantry had suddenly fallen upon us. I was in Troy, New York, when the sad intelligence of the reverse to our arms at Bull Run was received. This was followed quickly by another call for volunteers, and I decided without hesitation to enter the army. In accordance with my resolve, I enlisted as a private soldier at Troy on the 6th day of August, 1861, in a company raised by Captain Clarence Buell for the cavalry service. To encounter the chivalrous Black Horse Cavalry of Bull Run fame, it was proposed to raise a force in the North, and as Senator Ira Harris of New York was giving this organization his patronage and influence, a brigade was formed whose banner should bear his name. Originally, the regiment to which my company was assigned was intended for the regular army, and was for some time known as the 7th United States Cavalry. 
but the government having decided to have but six regiments of regular cavalry, and as New York had contributed the majority of the men to the organization, we were denominated the Second Regiment of New York Cavalry, Harris Light. This regiment was organized by J. Mansfield Davies of New York as Colonel, assisted by Judson Kilpatrick of New Jersey as Lieutenant Colonel. The men were mostly from the states of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Vermont, Pennsylvania, and Indiana. August 13. Today, Captain Buell's company of Trojans was summoned together for the purpose of leaving for the South. Under a severe drenching rain, we were drawn up in line fronting the residence of General John E. Wool, when the old veteran delivered a most heroic address, which led us quite to forget the pelting rain, and prepared us for our departure. The boys then found a very pleasant shelter on board the Vanderbilt, bound for New York City. The day following, all the New York State men rendezvoused at 648 Broadway, and were mustered into the service of the United States by Lieutenant Colonel D. B. Sackett of the regular army. At four o'clock p.m., we were ordered aboard a train of cars and told that our destination was Camp Howe, near Scarsdale, twenty-four miles north of the city, between the Harlem and East Rivers. We reached the place just in time to pitch our tents for the night, an operation which was not only new and strange, but performed in anything but a workmanlike manner. We had everything to learn, and this was our first lesson in soldiering. Captain A. N. Dufier of Company A, a Frenchman and graduate of the Military School of Saint-Cyr, France, is in command of the camp, and is to be the superintendent of our discipline and drill. He is undoubtedly well qualified for this position. August 16. This morning we commenced the inevitable drill on foot, as we are still without horses. We find this exercise very severe, and yet, in view of its great importance, we accept it with a good degree of relish. Our drill master is thorough and rigidly strict, after the fashion of the French schools. We cannot avoid learning under his tuition. In the afternoon we were set to policing camp. This comprises the cleaning of one of the roughest farms in the country of stone and as a remuneration to the owners for the use of this most unsightly of God's forsaken ground, we are compelled to build stone fences, a very unpleasant introduction to military life, and an occupation which by no means accords with our ideas of a soldier's duties. But our hands toil with a protest in our hearts, and with a certain resolve that this kind of fencing must not long continue. After a week spent in drill and the Stonewall Enterprise, we were all surprised one morning with an order to fall in line to receive a Napoleonic harangue from Captain Dufier. So many and even loud had been our protests, and so glaringly manifest our rebellious spirit on the subject of fortifying a farm in the state of New York, that the captain undoubtedly feared that he might not be very zealously supported by us in his future movements, and so, like Napoleon, on assuming command of the army of Italy, he sought to test the devotion of his men. After amusing us a while in his broken English, and arousing us by his touching appeals to our patriotism and honor, at length he shouted, Now, as many of you are ready to follow me to the cannon's mouth, take a one step to the front. This dernier result to pride was perfectly successful, and the whole line took the desired step. We were then ordered to be ready to leave camp at eleven o'clock that morning, which was on the 20th of August, assured that Washington, D.C. was our destination. Our ranks were quickly broken, and all due preparation made for our departure. After marching to Scarsdale, we took cars and were soon landed in the metropolis, through the principal streets of which our command passed to the Jersey City Ferry. 
Without much delay we reached Philadelphia in the evening, where we were bountifully supplied with rations by her proverbially generous and patriotic people. True to the instinct of brotherly love, the citizens are making arrangements such as would indicate that millions of Union soldiers might be fed at their tables. Here we spent the night. The next morning at 6.30 we were on our way southward. A brief halt was made in Baltimore, whose streets still seemed to be speaking of the blood of the brave Massachusetts men. And as we march along, we can but recall the poet's prophecy. And the eagle, never dying, still is trying, still is trying, with its wings upon the map to hide a city with its gore. But the name is there forever, and it shall be hidden never, while the awful brand of murder points the avenger to its shore. While the blood of peaceful brothers God's dread vengeance doth implore, thou art doomed, O Baltimore. At four o'clock p.m. we beheld the dome of the nation's capital, and after landing we were marched to the eastern part of the city and pitched tents near Camp Oregon, named thus in honor of Colonel Edward D. Baker, who represented the territory in the Senate of the United States, previous to his acceptance of a military commission, and who is now in command of the famous California Regiment, which occupies this camp. End of chapter 1「2 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry」by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Linebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 2 Camp Life and Its Influences 1861 Our Unmilitary Appearance First Equipage my black mare, good and evil influences, newsboys, mailbag, letter writing, the bugle corps, camp guard, guerrillas under Turner Ashby, mounted drill, laughable experiences with horses, southern egotism, northern fancies. Drill, drill! and camp police are the order of the day. Indeed, we have nothing else to do, and to do nothing at all is the hardest kind of work. We expect soon to have some accoutrements to en enable us to drill something besides our feet. Our preparations for war have commenced at the extremities, for thus far nothing but our heads and feet have been instructed. However, as we become better acquainted with this part of our duty, we enjoy it better than at first, and we think we are making no very mean progress. For some time after our arrival here, the government was unable to supply us with uniforms, or weapons of war, and our appearance was far from being a la militaire, as Captain Duffier would have it. Coming as we did from colleges and schools, from offices and counting rooms, from shops and farms, and some from no occupation at all, each with the peculiar dress he wore when he enlisted, and already pretty well worn out by our labors at Camp Howe and extensive traveling, we were a most unsightly, heterogeneous mass of humanity, and were subject of no little sport to our better-clad fellow-soldiers. Especially this was the case when on a certain day General B. F. Butler reviewed the troops of this department, and we were made to appear before him and the multitude with our hats and caps, our coats and jackets, in nearly all colors, and many of them in rags and shags. We certainly had nothing to recommend us to the consideration of military men except the courageous spirit that throbbed in our generally robust frames. 
but we were hopeful of better days, when we might have the appearance and equipage, as well as the internal qualities of soldiers. But the government was so wholly unprepared for war that our supplies were received very slowly. First came our uniforms, which every man donned gladly, and yet with a feeling that the last link to civil life for the present was severed, and that henceforth, in a very peculiar sense, we belonged to our common country. A few days after our arrival at Camp Oregon, we were joined by the men who belonged to our regiment from other states. This added fresh enthusiasm, as well as new strength, to our ranks. However, there is as yet nothing in our tout ensemble to distinguish us from infantry or artillery except the yellow trimming of our blue uniforms, whereas the infantry has the light blue trimming and the artillery bright red. August 23rd. Today I am happy to make the following entry in my diary, namely, the regiment was furnished with sabers, Colt's revolvers, and all the necessary appendages, consisting of belts and ammunition boxes. Every man has a new care and pride to keep his saber bright and his entire outfit clean, that he may wear them with pleasure to himself and honor to his comrades. The morning and evening of the 24th were spent in saber exercise, with which we were all delighted. This is the first development in us of the cavalry element as such, and we begin to feel our individuality. We desire to have this growth continue uninterruptedly, and in aid of it, in the early part of September, came quite a large installment of horses and equipments. This occurred while the regiment occupied a camp about three miles from Washington, on the Bladensburg Road, which we named Sussex, in honor of Sussex County, New York, our colonel's native county. As the number of horses furnished us at this time was not sufficient to mount the whole command, the number received by each company was proportioned to the maximum roll of its men. After the non-commissioned officers of each company, including all the sergeants and corporals, had drawn their horses according to rank, the privates were made to draw lots for the remainder, a performance which produced no little amount of excitement. Several of our comrades were of course unfortunately compelled for several days to march on foot, though much against their wishes, for nothing could be more humiliating to a dragoon than to be trudging through the mud and dust, while his companions were gliding past him with their neighing steeds, on their way to the drill grounds or to any other post of duty. It was my good fortune to be the recipient of a beautiful black mare, only five years old, full of life and fiery metal, fourteen hands high and weighing ten hundred pounds. She was a gem for the cavalry service or anything else, and a friendship was to grow up between us worthy of historic mention. We are now fairly out upon the ocean of our new life, and are beginning to feel its influence. It does not take the careful observer long to notice the effects which outward changes and circumstances have upon the characters of most men. Indeed, no man remains unaffected by them. He either advances or retrogrades, and it is very apparent already among us that while soldiering does make some men, it unmakes many. The very lowest stratum of life among us, such as represents the loungers in the streets and lanes of our cities, those who have neither occupation nor culture, is amazingly influenced for the better by military discipline. These men now find themselves with something to do, and with somebody to make them do it. Progress is very slow, it is true, and in some cases exceptional, but this is evidently the general tendency. But on the other hand, our regiment is made up partly of young men from respectable families, reared under the influences of a pure morality, 
but they find that the highest standard of morality presented here is much lower than they were wont to have at home, and they soon begin to waver. Thus, having lost their first moorings of character, they start downward, and in many instances are precipitated to horrible depths. Quote, when once a shaking monarchy declines, each thing grows bold and to its fall combines. End quote. Only a few have sufficient force in themselves to effectually resist these evils. It must be remembered that the wholesome and normal restraints of virtuous female society are wholly removed from us, and from what we daily see around us we are convinced that a colony of men only, however virtuous or moral, would in a short time run into utter barbarism. No candid observer can doubt the teaching of the old scripture that it is not good for man to be alone. Moreover, the friends and associates of our childhood's innocence, whose presence always calls forth the purest memories, are not with us, nor do we feel the almost omnipotent influences of the old schoolhouse gatherings, of the church-going bell, and of the home fireside. When you sever all these ties and helps to a moral life, and throw a man in the immediate association of the vicious, he must be only a little less than an angel not to fall. Here we are all dressed alike, live alike, and are all subject to like laws and discipline. The very man who shares our blanket and tent cover, who draws rations from the same kettle, who drinks from the same canteen, and with whom we are compelled to come in contact daily, may be the veriest poltrude, whose diploma shows graduation at the five points, and whose presence alone is morally miasmatic. Consequently, our camp is infested more or less with gambling, drunkenness, and profanity, and all their train of attending evils, and at times we long for campaigning in the field where it seems to us we may rid ourselves of this demoralization. Hannibal's toilsome marches across the Alps and through Upper Italy only gave hardihood and courage to his legions, who came thundering at the very gates of Rome and threatening its immediate overthrow, but a winter's camp life at Capua left them shorn of their strength. But then we have remedial influences even in camp, and we hail them with no little delight. Daily the newsboys make their appearance, calling out, Washington Chronicle and New York Papers! They enjoy an extensive patronage. With these sheets, many moments are pleasantly spent, as their columns are eagerly perused. Then, following hard on the track of the newsboys, comes our adjutant's orderly or courier with a mail-bag full of letters, precious mementos from the loved ones at home. These messages are the best reminders we have of our home life, especially when they are brimful, as is usually the case, with patriotic sparkling and with affection's purest libations. These letters have a double influence. While they keep the memories of home more or less bright within us, and at times so bright as we read we can almost see our mothers, wives, and sisters in their tender Christian solicitude for us, they also stimulate us to greater improvements in the epistolary art. Men who never wrote a letter in their lives before are at it now. Those who cannot write at all are either learning or engage their comrades to write for them, and the command is doing more writing in one day than I should judge we used to do in a month, and perhaps a year. No sooner are the contents of the mailbag distributed and devoured by the eager newsmongers than active preparations are made for responding. Some men carry pocket ink stands and write with pens, but the majority use pencils. Here you see one seated on a stump or fence, addressing his sweetheart or somebody else. Another writes standing up against a tree, while a third is lying flat on the ground. 
Thus, either in the tents or in the open air, scribbling is going on, and the return mail will carry many sweet words to those who cannot be wholly forgotten. I suppose in this way we are not only making but writing history. Camp life, then, is not entirely monotonous. The Bugle Corps Sight and sounds of interest may be seen and heard at almost every hour of the day. The morning is ushered in with the shrill reveille, which means awake and rise. This is well executed by our bugle corps, which Captain Dufier has organized and is drilling thoroughly. All our movements are now ordered by the bugle. By its blast we are called to our breakfast, dinner, and supper. Roll call is sounded twice a day, and the companies fall into line, when the first sergeants easily ascertain whether every man is at his post of duty. The bugle calls the sick, and sometimes those who feign to be, to the surgeon's quarters, and their wants and woes are attended to. By the bugle we are summoned to inspections, to camp guard, to the feeding and watering of our horses, and to drill. A peculiarly shrill call is that which brings all the first or orderly sergeants to the adjutant's quarters to receive any special order he may have to communicate. Thus call after call is sounded at intervals throughout the day, ending with taps, which is the signal for blowing out the lights and seeking the rest that night demands. Camp Guard our principal duties now are camp guard and drill, which we perform by turns. Every morning quite a large force is detailed, with a commissioned officer in command for guard duty. These form a line of dismounted pickets, or vedettes, around the entire camp. They are stationed within sight and hailing distance of each other, enabling them to prevent anyone from leaving or entering camp without a written pass in the daytime, or the countersign at night. The rule is to have each man stand post for two hours when he is relieved. This is the maximum time, and sometimes made less at the discretion of the commandant. We are told as we perform this duty that it is not very unlike the picketing that will be required of us if we are ever permitted to take the field which confronts the enemy. Indeed, this is picketing on a small scale. And our enthusiasm in this branch of our work increases, as we are almost daily in receipt of accounts of attacks on our pickets along the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the Cumberland Canal. It appears that a certain Colonel Turner Ashby, with a force of cavaliers, acting as guerrillas, singly and in squads, is nightly endeavoring to sever our telegraph wires, to burn on railroad bridges, and to destroy the canal, or fire at our men on the passing boats, and not infrequently we read of skirmishes in which several of our pickets have been either captured, wounded, or killed. Of course, we expect before long to face Mr. Ashby and his confederates, and we are preparing ourselves for it. Mounted Drill But this we do specially in the drill. Recently the balance of our men were gladdened with a full supply of horses. Mounted drill is now the general order, and nearly all of our time not otherwise occupied is devoted to this exercise. At first we had some exciting times with our young and untrained horses. One of our men received a kick from his horse, which proved fatal to his life. Several of our wildest and seemingly incorrigible ones we have been compelled to run up the steepest hills in the vicinity, under the wholesome discipline of sharp spurs, until the evil has been sweated out of them. We find, however, that the trouble is not only with the horses, but frequently with the men many of whom have never bridled a horse nor touched a saddle. And then, too, these curbed bits in the mouths of animals that had been trained with the common bridle 
produced a most rebellious temper, causing many of them to rear up in the air as though they had suddenly been transformed into monstrous kangaroos, while the riders showed signs of having taken lessons in somersets. Some of the scenes are more than ludicrous. Horses and men are acting very awkwardly also, with the guiding of the animal by the rein against the neck, and not by the bit, as we were accustomed to do at home. We do not wonder much that the chivalrous black horse gentry have expressed their contempt of northern mudsills and greasy mechanics, and have made their brags that we could never match them. But then it is said that these Southrons were born in a saddle, and were always trained in horsemanship. They generally perform their pleasure excursions, go on their business journeys, and even to church on horseback. They were therefore prepared for the cavalry service before we had so much as thought of it. But let them beware of what they think, or say, for we can learn, and it does frequently occur that somewhere in the life of contending parties the first is last, and the last first. We are improving rapidly. There is so much exhilaration in the shrill bugle notes which order the movements of the drill, and so much life in its swift evolutions, that the men and horses seem to dance rather than walk on their way to the drill grounds, and both are readily learning the certain sounds of the trumpet, and becoming masters of motions and dispositions required of them. Like all other apprentices, of course, we occasionally indulge in the reveries of imagination, and we think we are laying the foundation of a career which is destined to be important and glorious. Be this as it may, we do not mean to be outstripped by any one in our knowledge and practice of cavalry tactics and of the general maneuverings of war. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter Three Preparations for Active Service. 1861. First Advance. Contrabands, Their Hopes and Treatment. Union ranks filling up. Promotion. Foraging and its obstacles. Scouting and its aim. Senator Harris visits the command. Ball's Bluff. Recruiting service. Interesting incidents. Camp Palmer. Contrabands at work. Drilling near Arlington Heights. Colonel George D. Bayard, Fight at Drainsville. October 15, 1861 The Harris Light broke camp at 8 o'clock a.m. and marched proudly through Washington, crossed the famous Long Bridge over the Potomac, and moved forward to Munson's Hill in full view of our infantry outposts where we established a new camp calling it advance. For the first time, our horses remained saddled through the night, and the men slept on their arms. To us, this was a new and exciting phase of life. Since our retreat from Bull Run, the rebel army has made itself formidable on this line, and though no active movements have been attempted on Washington, we are nevertheless apprehensive of such a measure on their part. Hence our picket lines are doubly strong and vigilant, while every means is resorted to to ascertain the position, strength, and intention of our wily foe. Frequently contrabands feel their way through the enemy pickets under cover of the night, and through the tangled brushwood which abounds, and reach our lines safely. From them we gain much valuable information of the state of things in Dixie. 
Some of them, we learn, were employed by rebel leaders in constructing forts and earthworks, and in various ways were made to contribute muscle to the Southern Confederacy. They have strange and exciting stories to tell us, and yet it seems as though they might be of great service to us if we saw fit to employ them as guides in our movements. Their heart is with us in this conflict. They hail us as friends, and entertain wild notions about a jubilee of liberty, for which they are ever praying and singing, and look upon us as their deliverers. How they have formed such opinions is somewhat difficult to conjecture, especially when we consider the anomalous treatment they have received from our hands. The authorities have seemed to be puzzled with regard to them, and there are cases where they have even been returned to their former owners. And yet there seems to be an instinctive prophecy in their natures, which leads them to look to Northmen for freedom. Their presence in our camps becomes a sort of inspiration to most of us, and we only wish that their prayers may be answered, and that every chain of servitude may be broken. This sentiment at times breaks out in such as the following poetic strain, quote, In the beauty of the lily Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make them free. End quote. And as slavery was the cause, and not as some say the pretext of the war, if the Union arms succeed, this irrepressible conflict and villainous wrong must come to an end. Our confidence in the ultimate success of our arms is daily increasing. Since the 1st of August our ranks have been wonderfully swelled, and now regiment after regiment, battery after battery, is pouring in from the north, filling the camps of instruction and manning the fortifications around Washington. Meanwhile, earthworks are being constructed on all the high hills and commanding positions. Strong abati are made of the forest trees, and everything done that can give the city an air of security and the country round about the appearance of a bristling porcupine. Should this influx of troops continue, we shall be compelled to advance our lines for very room on which to station them. We have some intimations that our advance to this point today is preparatory to such a movement. The day following our advance, I was promoted to the rank of corporal. On the recommendation of Captain Buell, my appointment to date from the 15th. On the 16th, our lines were advanced to Vienna, a station on the Leesburg Railroad, and on the 17th, as far as Fairfax Courthouse, the Confederates falling back toward Centerville and Manassas without offering the least resistance. Foraging and Scouting We are spending our time mostly in foraging, scouting, and patrolling. In consequence of imperfect transportation, the cavalry especially is compelled to seek its own forage, with which, however, the country abounds. Corn is found in right smart heaps, as the natives say, either in the fields or barns, and hayricks dot the country on every side. But there is a certain degree of scrupulousness on the part of some of our commanders with regard to appropriating the produce of the sacred soil to our own use, which greatly embarrasses our foraging expeditions and exasperates not a little those of us who are needy of the things we are at times ordered not to take. It is no uncommon thing to find one of our men stationed as safeguard over the property of a most bitter rebel, a property which, in our judgment, ought to be confiscated to the use of the Union or utterly destroyed. We do not believe in handling rebels with kid gloves, and especially when we know that the very men whom we protect are constantly giving information to the enemy of all our movements, and using their property whenever they can to aid and comfort the cause of treason. 
we are too forcibly reminded of the fable we used to read in our schoolboy days of the farmer and the viper. We are only warming into new life and strength this virus of rebellion, to have it recoil upon ourselves. We hope our authorities will soon discover their error and change their tactics. Our scouting is on a limited scale, though it affords considerable exercise and excitement. Thereby we are learning the topography of the country and making small maps of the same. We are traversing the forests through the wood roads and bypaths which run in every direction, strolling by the streams and ravines, and gaining all the information which can be of use to us in future maneuverings. We scout in small squads over the entire area occupied by our forces, and often beyond, and now and then, more frequently in the night, we patrol between our picket posts to ascertain that all is well at the points most exposed to danger. The principal object of scouting is to learn the strength and position of the enemy, while the object of patrolling is to learn our own. October 20th. Today the regiment was honored by a visit from its patron, Senator Ira Harris. After witnessing a mounted drill and parade, which pleased him much, he presented us a beautiful stand of colors, accompanied by an appropriate and eloquent address. He made especial reference to the object of the organization, the hopes of its friends, and their earnest prayers for its future usefulness and success. He dwelt enthusiastically upon the work before us. At the close of the speech, the command responded with a rousing round of cheers, expressive of their thankfulness for the banner and of their determination to keep it, to stand by it, and to defend it even with their lives. The occasion was one to be remembered. Ball's Bluff Another great pall of sadness has fallen upon our soldiers. The papers bring intelligence of our terrible disaster at Ball's Bluff, and the promising Colonel E. D. Baker has fallen, while gallantly leading his noble Californians. Discussions as to the cause or causes of that fatal advance and bloody retreat are going on throughout our camps. It does seem to many as though gross incompetency or treachery must have influenced the authorities having immediate oversight of the affair, and that our fallen braves have been needlessly immolated upon their country's altar. Quote, Big Bethel, Bull Run, and Ball's Bluff, O oh, alliteration of blunders, of blunders more than enough, in a time full of blunders and wonders. End quote. But the boys are enthusiastic over the bravery of our 1900 who fought against a force more than twice their number, with all the advantage of position and knowledge of the country. All our battles have proven that our men can fight, and though Providence seems to have been against us thus far, for reasons most inscrutable, we will not waver in our determination to dare or die in the contest. Our chief difficulties are not in the rank and file of the army, but in the general management of the forces, and we trust that ere long right men will be found to take the places of incompetent ones. Recruiting Service Today I was detailed by Colonel Davies to proceed to New York with Lieutenant Morton on recruiting service. We went on to Newburgh, near the lieutenant's native home, where we spent a few days together, but on the 1st of November I was ordered to Troy to act independently. I spent several weeks in this peculiar work and with good success. Though recruiting offices could be found in, on all the principal streets of our cities and villages, yet a good business was done by them all. Such was the enthusiasm which prevailed among the people. War meetings were frequently held and addressed by our best orators. 
the press, with few exceptions, poured forth its eloquent appeals to the strong-bodied men of the country to range themselves on the side of right against wrong. Violence would be done to truth did we not mention also that the pulpits of the land were potent helpers in this work, by their religious patriotism and persistent efforts to keep the great issue distinctly before the people. Thus the mind and heart of the North were kept alive to the great problem of the nation's existence, and men were rallying to our standard. It was no uncommon thing to receive applications to enter our lists from young men or boys too young and slender to be admitted, who left our offices in tears of disappointment, unless we could find for them a position as drummers and buglers. A single instance of enlistment under my observation might be mentioned, as it gives a specimen of the manner in which our work went on. Having taken passage on the cars one day from one point of my labors to another, I fell in with a young man who was on his way to college, where he expected to be matriculated the following day. His valise was full of books and other students' requisites, and his heart full of literary ambition. Attracted to me by my uniform, he soon learned my business, and after a few moments of pensiveness to my surprise, he told me to inscribe his name among my recruits. Then turning to a friend on board the car, he said, Take this trunk to my home and tell my mother I have enlisted in a cavalry regiment. December 4th Today I returned from recruiting service, bringing with me our enlisted men who had not been sent previously to the regiment. I found the Harris Light occupying Camp Palmer on Arlington Heights, the confiscated property of the rebel General Robert E. Lee. On arriving in camp, I found that the papers from Washington contained a letter from Secretary Seward directing General McClellan not to return to their former owners contrabands in our lines. This order, when fully understood by our colored friends, will undoubtedly increase their exit from Egypt, as many of them style their escape from bondage. The government will probably adopt measures to give these fugitives systematic assistance and labor, that they may be of use to us. Already I find that goodly number of our officers have adopted them for cooks and hostlers, in which positions they certainly excel, and there is no good reason why we may not employ them as teamsters on our trains and helpers in our trenches. They are generally very powerful and show signs of great endurance. Nor do we find them unwilling to labor, as we have been so often told they were. However, we do not wonder much that they have acquired the reputation of being lazy, for what but a thing or animal could take pleasure in unrequited toil? Now they have a personal interest, and take a peculiar delight in what they do for us. Their great willingness and ability to work for Uncle Sam or any of his boys would indicate that they will become eminently useful in the service of their country. From Camp Palmer the regiment had gone out to drill for some time, and here we continued through the month, generally occupying the large plain which lies between the Arlington House and the Potomac, and in full view of Washington. On this field Kilpatrick, Davies, Dufier, and others began to develop their soldierly qualities, infusing them into their commands, and imparting that knowledge of cavalry tactics which would prepare us for the stern duties of war. We have been recently greatly encouraged by the movements of Colonel George Dashiell Bayard of the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry, who on the 27th of November, while on a scout on the road to Leesburg, Loudoun County, met a band of the chivalry near Drainsville with whom he had a spirited skirmish. The whole affair would indicate that Colonel Bayard is destined to be no mean cavalry leader. 
Cavalry regiments from most of the loyal states have been organized and are now in camps of instruction. Occasionally they go out scouting, picketing, etc., and are thus preparing for the coming campaigns. December 20th. Today a brigade of Pennsylvanians, including two squadrons of Colonel Bayard's cavalry regiment, the whole force under command of General E.O.C. Ord, while foraging in the vicinity of Drainsville, were attacked by a rebel force nearly equal in numbers, with General J.E.B. Stewart commanding in person. A lively contest followed, in which the rebels were thoroughly beaten and driven from the field, losing, according to their own accounts, about 250 in killed, wounded, and captured. They left 25 dead horses on the field, with the debris of two caissons, disabled and exploded by the well-directed fire of Easton's battery, which accompanied the expedition. The rebels, who had undoubtedly come out for the purpose of forage as well as ourselves, having a long wagon train, retreated toward Fairfax Courthouse, with their wagons laden with their wounded. Our loss includes only nine killed and sixty wounded. Unimportant as this victory might seem, it caused an immense rejoicing in the Union ranks. It was a fitting answer to the calumny heaped upon us from both north and south that our soldiers could not fight and were no match for their boastful enemy. End of chapter 3「Three Years in the Federal Cavalry」by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 4 The Advance to the Rappahannock. 1862. All Quiet Along the Potomac. Preparations. Army of the Potomac Moves. Capture of the Quaker Guns at Centerville. Return to Defenses. Guerrillas. Their Attacks and Stratagems. The Bovine Foe. Picketing. How it is done. Sufferings. McClellan to the Peninsula. Virginia Weather and the People. General Augur's Advance to the Rappahannock. Lieutenant Decker's Bravery and Death Night Charge on Falmouth Heights Fredericksburg Surrenders How Citizens Regard Us Guarding a Train to Thoroughfare Gap Fight and Captures at Flipper's Orchard Shenandoah Valley The 5th New York Cavalry 1st Ira Harris Guard Death of Turner Ashby Strange Cavalry Tactics Personal Bravery of Captain Hammond End of the Peninsular Campaign The winter was one of preparation, not of operation. Why we were kept all quiet along the Potomac until the announcement, reiterated through the press, elicited only disdainful merriment among our friends was never satisfactorily explained. The month of December had been beautiful, the roads in excellent condition, the army well supplied and disciplined, so that nothing but hesitancy in our leaders stood in the way of army movements. The North and West, which had supplied myriads of men and millions of money, were becoming very impatient with such a state of things. This feeling was intensified by the fact that it was known that the enemy was tireless in his efforts to increase his army and to fortify his strongholds, while he was also gaining the sympathy of foreign powers, and by means of blockade running was adding not a little to his munitions of war. The army shared largely this general discontent. Why do we not advance? was everywhere the interrogation of eager officers and men. However, 
we were not wholly unemployed, for while we waited for reinforcements and cannon, as demanded by the general in command, and for the leaves to fall from the trees to facilitate movements in a country so thickly wooded as is Virginia, we were kept busy with camp curriculum, namely the drill, the guard, the inspection, and parade. General Lee's plantation on Arlington Heights and the surrounding country was thoroughly trodden by loyal feet, as men and horses were acquiring the form and power of military life. THE ARMY OF THE POTOMAC But our quiet was to be broken by a grand advance, which commenced on the 3rd of March. The Harris Light broke camp at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, with several regiments of cavalry under the command of Colonel W. W. Averill, led the advance, the Harris Light having the position of honor as vanguard. We were ordered to move slowly and cautiously, which we did, on the main thoroughfare known as the Little River Turnpike, and at four o'clock p.m. we arrived at Fairfax Courthouse, having marched only about fourteen miles. What was our surprise to find the place entirely deserted by the enemy, who had left the day previous with the design of retiring beyond the Rappahannock. This change of affairs seemed so sudden as to be full of mystery, and was wholly unknown even to our secret corps. We could not doubt but that this movement was performed in anticipation of some of our contemplated maneuverings, of which the rebel leaders are generally informed by their spies in Washington and all through our lines, even before they are known to our army. Our march was resumed the following day at ten o'clock a.m., and early in the afternoon we captured the Quaker guns at Centerville. The enemy had actually placed in the earthworks or forts which commanded the road large trunks of trees resembling cannon of heavy caliber, which frowned down upon us from the heights. Had it not been for the information we had received from contrabands on the march, that the enemy had evacuated, a report confirmed by the curling smoke which rose from various parts of the field, this formidable array of threatening cannon would have terrified us all, and greatly retarded our progress. Indeed, it was not till after the suspicious works had been thoroughly scanned with field glasses that we were ordered to advance, when the strong position was carried without the snapping of a cap or a saber stroke. Chagrin was written on every face. Not a sign of the enemy was visible, save the deserted remains of their winter quarters, which fell into our hands. A very brief halt was here made, and hurrying our steps, we soon crossed the memorable Bull Run, and came up with the rear guard of the retiring army at Manassas Junction. Here we pitched into them, and kicked up a little dust on the road to Bristow. This expedition, or wild goose chase, was continued to Warrenton Junction, where General George D. Stoneman found the enemy in force but returned without attacking them. Having loitered about this historic fields a few days, our whole force began to fall back towards its old position on the Potomac, establishing our advanced picket lines, however, as far forward as Centerville, with Fairfax Courthouse as headquarters. Our line of pickets intercepted the Leesburg Turnpike at Drainsville and extends to the Potomac, distance of about twenty miles. Guerrillas and Bushwhackers As guerrillas and their brethren, the bushwhackers, infest the country more or less, picketing is dangerous as well as difficult. Between the Rappahannock and the Potomac lies a vast territory which abounds in creeks, marshes, deep dark forests, with only here and there a village or settlement. A little to the west of this plain extend the Bull Run Mountains, with their ravines and caverns. This is a very fit hiding place for mischief-makers. 
The guerillas consist mostly of farmers and mechanics, residents of this region, who by some means are exempt from the Rebel conscription. Most of them follow their usual avocations during the day, and have their rendezvous at night, where they congregate to lay their plans of attack on the pickets. They resort to every stratagem which a vile and savage spirit could inspire. Sometimes a picket is approached by the stealthiest creeping through the dark thickets, when the unfortunate sentinel is seized and quickly dispatched by a bowie knife, or other like weapon, which a Southron can always use most dexterously. When mere stealth cannot accomplish the task, other methods are used. For instance, on a dark night, a vedette, stationed by a thick underbrush, heard a cowbell approaching him, and supposing that the accompanying rustle of leaves and crackling of dry limbs was occasioned by a bovine friend, unwittingly suffered himself to be captured by a bushwhacker. But the boys soon learned to be suspicious of every noise they heard, so much so that one night a picket, hearing footsteps approaching him, cried out, Halt! Who comes there? His carbine was instantly brought to ready, and as no halt occurred, nor answer was made, a second challenge was given. But failing to effect anything, he fired in the direction of the noise, when he distinctly heard a heavy fall, and then groans, as of somebody dying. The sergeant of the post, running up to ascertain the cause of the alarm, found that an unfortunate ox, that had been grazing his way through the forest, lay dying, with his forehead perforated by the faithful sentry's bullet. The incident caused considerable merriment, and the pickets were supplied with poor Confederate beef during the remainder of their term of duty. But the attacks are frequently of a more disastrous character, resulting in the killing of men and horses, in wounds and in captures. The utmost care and strictest vigilance cannot secure us perfectly from depredations. Our general plan is as follows. The major part of the regiment or picket detail establishes what we denominate the main reserve, within a mile or two in rear of the center of the line of vedettes, or at a point where their assistance, in case of an attack, can be secured at any place in the line at the shortest possible notice. About midway between the main reserve and the picket lines are stationed two, three, or four picket reliefs, so situated as to form, with the line of vedettes for a base, a pyramid, with its apex at the main reserve. Picket Duty The boys will not soon forget the long, dreary, dangerous hours they spent along this line. Here we find ourselves shivering around a miserable fire among the sighing pines, though in times of special danger we are not permitted to have even this slight comfort for fear of detection. Often compelled to sit or lie down in snow or mud, or to walk about smartly to prevent freezing to death. Sometimes, when much exhausted, we have laid ourselves down on the damp and muddy ground, which was frozen stiffly all around us when we awoke. Frozen fingers and toes are no uncommon things. In this wretched plight we hear the summons to get ready to stand post. We go out upon our shivering horses to sit in the saddle for two hours or more, facing the biting wind, and peering through the storm of sleet, snow, or rain, which unmercifully pelts us in its fury. But it were well for us if this was our worst enemy, and we consider ourselves happy if the gorilla does not creep through the bushes impenetrable to the sight to inflict his mortal blows. The two hours expire, relief comes, and the vedette returns to spend his four, six, or eight hours off post, as best he may. Once at least during the night we are visited by the grand guard, which consists of the officer of the day, accompanied by others, 
whose duty it is to make a thorough, though usually swift, inspection of the picket line. Most of our time is spent in this duty. March 29th. Considerable excitement prevailed among us today, as Colonel Bayard was dispatched with a detachment of his regiment to repulse a dastardly raid made by some of General J. E. B. Stewart's men on the house of a Mrs. Tennant, a Union lady, residing near Difficult Run, about six miles from Chain Bridge. Colonel Bayard reached the place a few moments too late, and the raiders succeeded in taking Mrs. Tennant as a prisoner, and making off with their prey. For several weeks the main portion of our grand army has been sent by transports to the peninsula with the evident intention of moving upon Richmond by shorter land routes than by way of Manassas. This change in our plans of attack was probably known by the rebels before they were matured at Washington, and we now understand why they so quietly evacuated their positions on our front. General McDowell remains in command of the defenses of Washington, with a force sufficient, it is believed, to give safety to the capital and to harass the rebels that continue before us. With the departure of General McClellan to the peninsula, our picket lines were withdrawn to Annandale and Falls Church, within a few miles of the fortifications of Washington. The Atmosphere and the People April 4. The Harris Light and the 1st Pennsylvania Cavalry were recalled from the picket lines and sent out on a reconnaissance in force with a division in command of General McDowell. Our march led us through Fairfax Courthouse in Centerville, near which we bivouacked for the night. Already at this early springtime, luxurious vegetable growth of green is beautifully carpeting the fields through which we pass and in which we halt. Flowers of great beauty and variety of hues and sweetness of perfume greet us on every hand. It would seem as though nature were struggling to hide the desolations which war has made, and were weaving her chaplets of honor around the graves of our fallen brothers. And it really seems as though destruction himself had contributed to this lavish growth. Thus, quote, life evermore is fed by death, in earth or sea or sky, and that a rose may breathe its breath something must die End quote. on the fifth we continued our march to bristow station on the orange and alexandria railroad where we encountered one of the most furious snowstorms ever known in this region of the country the wind which bore the snow was cold and cutting it was a season never to be forgotten by those who were quartered in mere shelter tents or had no tents at all so sudden are the changes of the atmosphere here that no man knoweth what a moment may bring forth. Yesterday we sought shelter from the sun's heat under the budding trees, while grass and flowers and singing birds indicated settled weather. Today the storm howls music through the bending pines, and snow several inches deep covers the earth. We are thoroughly convinced that the character of the people here greatly partakes of the nature of these surroundings. Is not this the case everywhere? But we see it here more plainly than we ever did before. The people are fitful, and their spasms are terrible, and yet we find them at times to be as kind and hospitable as any we have ever found elsewhere. After one has witnessed their beautiful days, cooled with a gentle sea breeze, which generally blows from about nine o'clock in the morning till six at night, and then their cool, calm evenings, he can see why there are so many lovely traits in the nature of the people. But if he experience some of their sudden and terrific snowstorms and showers, when the thunder and the lightning are such that a northerner feels that all the storms he has ever witnessed are only infantile attempts, he is inclined to extenuate, on mere climactic principles, 
the outbursts of wrath, and fire-eating propensities of the people. He who is gendered of fire and brimstone must have some vim in his composition. We believe this study is not unworthy the Christian philosopher and philanthropist. The day following the storm, the sun came out warmly, and the snow suddenly disappeared, but left us in a bed of mud. The soil, naturally rich and tender, consisting of a reddish loam, trodden by many feet, and cut by the wheels of heavy vehicles, became almost impassable. But it has this advantage, that it soon dries, so the soil, as well as the atmosphere and the people, is suddenly changeable. April 7. Today our expedition continued its march to Catlett's Station, a few miles south of Bristow. General Augur commands the advance, which consists of a brigade of infantry and two regiments of cavalry. On the 8th of the month a detachment of the Harris Light was ordered out on picket at 6 o'clock p.m and we enjoyed a quiet, pleasant trip on this usually unpleasant duty. Here we spent a few days picketing, scouting, and patrolling, and on the 17th we advanced from Catlett's in the direction of Falmouth on the Rappahannock. DEATH OF LIEUTENANT DECKER Our march was rapid, and lay through a country altogether new to us, which, however, presented no interesting features. The Harris Light had the advance, and was followed by the 14th Brooklyn. As our infantry comrades became footsore and weary, we exchanged positions with them for mutual relief, until at last one half of the regiments were bearing one another's burdens. This incident paved the way for a strong friendship to grow up between us. Seventeen miles were traveled quietly when a sudden fire on our advance guard brought every cavalryman to his horse and infantryman to his musket. Everything assumed the signs of a fight. Kilpatrick, who was in command of the regiment, ordered his band to the rear. This precaution of the commander was no sooner taken than the vanguard, in command of Lieutenant George Decker, was making a furious charge upon Field's cavalry which was doing outpost duty ten miles from Falmouth. On the very first assault, Lieutenant Decker fell from his horse, pierced through the heart with a fatal bullet. He was a daring young man, well-formed, light complexion, blue eyes, and about twenty-three years of age. He was much lamented by his many friends. His fall shocking as it was to the command, being our first fatal casualty, only seemed to nerve the men for bold revenge. And we had it. Like chaff before the whirlwind, the outpost was quickly scattered, and the whole regiment entered upon its first charge with a will, a charge which continued for several miles with wild excitement. Picket reliefs and reserves were swept away like forest trees before the avalanche, and we fell upon their encampment before time had been afforded them for escape. Here we captured several men and horses with large quantities of stores, and then rested our tired steeds and fed them with Confederate forage. The men enjoyed the captured rations. It was near night and as the sun disappeared the infantry force came up to our newly possessed territory the cavalry was ordered to stand to horse and a strong picket was thrown out to prevent any surprise attack or flanking movement of the enemy in the early part of the evening one of our pickets was surprised by the friendly approach of a citizen of falmouth who had come as he said to hail once more the old star-spangled banner and to greet his loyal brethren of the North. Such a patriotic and fearless individual among the white population of that section of country was a great rarity, and his protestations of friendship were at first received with some suspicion. 
He was, however, brought to General Augur's headquarters, where he gave satisfactory proof of his kind intentions, and then gave the general a full description of the position and strength of the enemy. Night Attack on Falmouth Heights A plan for a night attack was thereupon laid, and committed to Bayard and Kilpatrick. Our instructions were conveyed to us in a whisper. A beautiful moonlight fell upon the scene, which was as still as death and with a proud determination the two young cavalry chieftains moved forward to the night's fray. Bayard was to attack on the main road in front, but not until Kilpatrick had commenced operations on their right flank by a detour through a neglected and narrow wood path. As the heights were considered well-nigh impregnable, it was necessary to resort to some stratagem for which Kilpatrick showed a becoming aptness. Having approached to within hearing distance of the rebel pickets, but before we were challenged, Kilpatrick shouted with his clear voice which sounded like a trumpet on the still night air, "'Bring up your artillery in the center, and the infantry on the left!' "'Well, but, Colonel,' replied an honest, though rather obtuse captain, "'we haven't got any inf- "'Silence in the ranks!' commanded the leader. "'Artillery in the center! Infantry on the left!' The pickets caught and spread the alarm, and thus greatly facilitated our hazardous enterprise. "'Charge!' was the order, which then thrilled the ranks and echoed through the dark dismal woods, and the column swept up the rugged heights in the midst of blazing cannon and rattling musketry. So steep was the ascent that not a few saddles slipped off the horses, precipitating their riders into a creek, which flowed lazily at the base of the hill, while others fell dead and dying, struck by the missiles of destruction, which at times filled the air. But the red field was won, and the enemy, driven at the point of the sabre, fled unceremoniously down the heights, through Falmouth, and over the bridge which spanned the Rappahannock, burning the beautiful structure behind them to prevent pursuit. Quite a number of prisoners and various materials of war fell into our hands. Kilpatrick and Bayard were both highly complimented for their personal bravery on the occasion. April 18. This morning, at 8 o'clock, General Augur took peaceful possession of Falmouth, and here, with military honors, the remains of Lieutenant Decker and about fifteen others, who fell in the late struggle, were interred. Later in the day, and after considerable hesitation, the mayor of Fredericksburg formally surrendered the city to the Yankee general, whose guns on Falmouth Heights commanded obedience. A bridge of canal boats, similar to a pontoon, was constructed across the river, and we took possession of this beautiful, proud city. This was the first appearance of Yankees in this rebel locality, and we were the subject of no little curiosity. Many of the people, who by the misrepresentations of their licentious press and flaming orators, had been led to believe that Yankees were a species of one-eyed cyclops, or long-clawed harpies, or horned and hoofed devils, who had been deceived into the notion that President Lincoln was a deformed mulatto, degenerated into a hideous monkey, and that all his followers were of that sort, on seeing us, expressed great surprise, and wished to know if we were specimens of the Lincoln army. They had forgotten that our fathers fought side by side in our common country's early struggles, and that now we, their children, as brothers, ought all to sit unitedly under the tree of liberty, which they had planted in tears and nourished with blood. But it is painful to observe how the spirit of secession has blotted out the memories of past days and deeds, and filled their hearts with bitterness toward us. A few Union families in these parts, whose acquaintance we have made, assure us that their neighbors, who were formerly most hospitable and humane, 
have become through this Rebel virus incarnate fiends. To secede from the Union was evidently to secede from the God of virtue and charity. April 25. After spending a few days of tolerable quietness on the banks of the Rappahannock, with our camp near the Phillips House, Falmouth, a most lovely spot, we were today ordered out as escort or guard to a train destined for the Shenandoah Valley. Such a job is generally anything but pleasant to a cavalry force, for the movement is altogether too slow, especially when bad roads are encountered. And in case a team becomes balky or gives out, or a wagon breaks down, incidents which occur frequently, the whole column is in statu quo until the difficulty or disability is removed. And so we are halting, advancing, halting, and advancing again, with this monotonous variety repeated ad libitum, while the halts are often longer than the advances. But our slow motion gives us some opportunity to scout the country through which we pass, and to obtain any quantity of rations and forage for man and beast. By this means we are not compelled to consume much, if any, of the contents of our train. On the 28th we reached Thoroughfare Gap, through which the Manassas Gap Railroad finds its way over the Bull Run Mountains. Here we met a force from General Nathaniel P. Banks' army, to whose care we delivered the train. We remained a few days to scout through the country. On the 1st of May we started back towards Falmouth, but stopped several days at Bristerburg, a small town where we spent our time very pleasantly, scouting through the country and living upon its rich products. Here we are very much isolated from the rest of our army. We seldom get mail or receive any papers, except from rebel sources, and these are so meager of literary taste, and especially of reliable army news, that we dare not put much trust in their representations. However, we are satisfied from what we read, that our Grand Peninsular Army is making some telling demonstrations toward Richmond, and that the rebel General Thomas J. Jackson, surnamed Stonewall, since his famous defeat by General James Shields at Kernstown near Winchester, is still in the valley. We reached Falmouth today and took possession of our old camping ground in front of the Phillips House. We have but little to do except to graze our horses in the surrounding fields and to recruit our strength. We also have the usual camp work, namely policing, drilling, etc. This department is very quiet, though we hear of active movements elsewhere. On the 30th we had a severe rainstorm, with thunder and lightning, a la Virginie. The streams were greatly swollen, and mud was abundant, so as to retard movements before Richmond. June 6. The Harris Light crossed the Rappahannock and advanced six miles beyond Fredericksburg, where we got only a glimpse of some of Field's cavalry, who had not forgotten us. They kept themselves at a very respectful distance from us, and made themselves scarce whenever we made signs of an attack. For several days we bivouacked on that side of the river, and on the twelfth we returned to our camp at Falmouth Heights. On the 16th we were again thrown across the river, and made a reconnaissance several miles south, without finding any force of the enemy. Nothing of importance occurred until the 4th of July, when the Troy Company of the Harris Light, commanded by Lieutenant Robert Loudon, was sent out to celebrate this national holiday by a reconnaissance on the Telegraph Road south of Fredericksburg. We left camp at eight o'clock in the morning, and soon came in sight of a detachment of Bath Cavalry, doing patrol duty. After following them for some time, though not rapidly, we halted a few moments, and they lost sight of us, 
concluding doubtless that we had retired. This was just what we wanted. ATTACK AT FLIPPER'S ORCHARD On the south bank of the Po River, about twenty miles from Fredericksburg, was a beautiful orchard, owned by a Dr. Flipper. This lovely spot had been chosen by our bath friends for their outpost, their main reserve being a few miles farther south. On arriving at the orchard, with its luscious fruit and inviting shade, the squad we were still pursuing unsuspectingly unsaddled their horses, began to arrange preparations for their dinner, and to make themselves generally comfortable. Of this state of things we were informed by a contraband we chanced to meet. We then resolved either to share or spoil their coffee, so, moving forward at a trot until in sight of them, we swooped down upon the orchard like eagles. The surprised and frightened cavaliers fired but a few shots, and we captured twelve men and nine horses, and escaped with our lawful prey without having received a scratch. It was my good fortune to take prisoner Lieutenant Powell, the officer in command, and to receive as my own a fine silver-mounted revolver, which he reluctantly placed in my hand. It will be a fine souvenir of the war and of this Fourth of July. Shenandoah Valley some time in May, Colonel Bayard, with his regiment and a large portion of General McDowell's division, were sent to the Shenandoah Valley to share in the shifting military panorama which was there displayed. With the removal of the Army of the Potomac to the peninsula, the Confederate authorities dispatched General Jackson to the valley to threaten the upper Potomac and Maryland, thus making it necessary for a large Federal force to remain in these parts. General Banks was in command of that department. After the Battle of Kernstown, in which Jackson received the sobriquet of Stonewall and a sound thrashing, General Banks, who had set out for Warrenton, returned to the valley and pursued Jackson, but was unable to bring him to bay. The enemy's cavalry under Colonel Turner Ashby was frequently attacked by the Union cavalry under General John P. Hatch. On the 6th of May, the 5th New York Cavalry, 1st Ira Harris Guard, had a hand-to-hand -hand encounter with Ashby's men near Harrisonburg, where Yankee Sabres and Pluck had established a reputation. A portion of the same regiment under Colonel John R. Kenley at Front Royal added a new luster to their fame, on the 23rd of the same month, during Stonewall's flank movement on General Banks at Strasburg, and fought bravely during that memorable treat to Maryland. At this juncture of affairs, a division of General McDowell's forces, under General Shields, was dispatched to the valley to intercept Jackson, while General John C. Fremont was ordered by telegraph to the same scene from the mountain department. But unavoidably detained by almost impassable mountain roads and streams enormously swollen by recent rains, Fremont reached Strasburg just in time to see Jackson's last stragglers retreating through the town. His pursuit was very rapid, though no engagement was brought about until the 5th of June at Harrisonburg. Here Colonel Percy Wyndham on our side, and Turner Ashby, now a general on the rebel side, distinguished themselves in the cavalry. Ashby was killed. His loss was greatly lamented by his comrades. He always fought at the head of his men with the most reckless self-exposure, and for outpost duty and the skirmish line he left scarcely an equal behind him in either army. His humaneness to our men who had fallen into his hands caused many of them to shed tears at the intelligence of his death. Men of valor and kindness are always worthy of a better cause than that in which the rebels are engaged, but their merit is always appreciated. 
Upon the heel of this fight followed the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic, where Jackson eluded the combined Union forces which had been directed against him. During this memorable campaign, a curious military modus operandi had been resorted to in the Luray Valley, in which the cavalry had made itself doubly useful. A small force of our infantry and cavalry were surrounded by the enemy on the south bank of the Shenandoah River, which was so high as to be unfordable. As a last resort, the cavalrymen plunged into the stream, swimming their horses, and towing across the infantrymen, who clung to the animals' tails. A striking case of personal daring in this valley campaign is worthy of record here. During Banks' retreat from Winchester, on the 24th of May, four companies of the 5th New York Cavalry, under command of Captain Wheeler, were moving on the left bank of our retreating columns to protect them from any attacks by the rebel cavalry, which infested the wooded hills that lay along our route. Emerging from a thick wood, Captain John Hammond, who had the advance with eight or ten men, suddenly came upon a squad of mounted rebels and immediately called on them to surrender. However, they fled, firing as they went, but were closely pursued. Captain Hammond was riding a powerful horse, which he had taken from his home, and as his blood was up, he determined to capture one of the party at least, at all hazard. He soon came up to the hindmost, a strong man, with whom he exchanged several shots at close quarters, but without effect on either side, owing to their fearful gait through the timber and down a hill. Hammond's pistol became fouled by a cap, and the cylinder would not revolve. The rebel had two charges left. Quick work was now necessary. Another spurring of his horse brought him within arm's length of the flying rebel, whereupon he seized his coat collar with both hands and dragged him backward from his saddle. Holding firmly his grasp, both horses went from under them, and they fell pell-mell to the ground. Luckily, Hammond was uppermost, with one hand at the enemy's throat and the other holding the band of the pistol with which the rebel was trying to shoot him. As the two men were powerful, a fearful struggle ensued for the mastery of the pistol. Meantime, up rode one of Hammond's boys, who by his order fired at the upturned face of the obstinate foe, the ball grazing his scalp and causing him to relinquish his hold of the revolver, when he was forced to surrender. Thus ended one of the roughest yet amusing contests of the war. The prisoner proved to be one of Ashby's scouts, and the remainder of the party were all captured. But notwithstanding the personal bravery of our men, disaster and defeat had attended our operations in the valley. Nor was this the only field of disastrous changes. On the peninsula, sieges had been laid and raised, terrible battles fought, won, and lost, and thousands of our brave comrades had succumbed to the impure water and miasmatic condition of the country. The rebel general, J. E. B. Stewart, had astounded everybody by a raid around our entire army, cutting off communications, destroying stores, and capturing not a few prisoners. On the 2nd of July, this jaded army found a resting place at Harrison's Landing on the James River. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 5. Pope's Campaign in Northern Virginia. 1862. Kilpatrick at Beaver Dam. Captain John S. Mosby. Return of the Raiders. 
complimentary orders, the Harris Light at Anderson's Turnout, Rebel Account of the Scare, General John P. Hatch, His Misfortunes and Justification, Reconnaissances, Battle of Cedar Mountain, Hospital at Culpeper. General Stuart in close quarters. His adjutant general captured. Death of Captain Charles Walters. Pope driven back and waiting for reinforcements. Kilpatrick's fight at Brandy Station. Waterloo Bridge. Bristow Station. Manassas Junction. Battle of Groveton. Second Bull Run Chantilly and Death of Kearney General Pope Resigns Our prospects as a nation were anything but promising about the 4th of July, 1862. Our operations in the Shenandoah Valley had been very expensive and fruitless. The Peninsular Campaign, which promised so much at its beginning, which had proceeded at so fearful a cost of treasure and blood, was pronounced a failure at last, and the great armies, depleted and worn, were well-nigh discouraged. The celebration of the anniversary of our national birthday was observed throughout the loyal North in the midst of gloomy forebodings, and only the pure patriotism of governors of states and of the President of the United States gave people any ground of hope for success. In the army, changes of leaders were occurring, which produced no little amount of jealousy among the stars, and upon which the opinion of the rank and file was divided. On the 14th of July, General John Pope, having been called from a glorious career in the West, took command of the Army of Virginia, which was a consolidation of the commands of Fremont, Banks, and McDowell. Before General Pope left Washington, he ordered General Rufus King, who was in command at Fredericksburg, to make a raid on the Virginia Central Railroad for the purpose of destroying it at as many points as possible, and thus impede communications between Richmond and the Valley. This work was committed to our regiment. July 19. About six o'clock this evening, the Harris Light was set in rapid motion almost directly south. By means of forced march of forty miles through the night, at the gray dawn of the morning we descended upon Beaver Dam Depot on the Virginia Central, like so many ravenous wolves upon a broken fold. Here we had some lively work. The command was divided in several squads, and each party was assigned its peculiar and definite duty. So while some were destroying culverts and bridges, others were playing mischief with the telegraph wires, others still were burning the depot, which was nearly full of stores, and a fourth party was on the lookout. During our affray we captured a young Confederate officer, who gave his name as Captain John S. Mosby. By his sprightly appearance and conversation he attracted considerable attention. He is slight yet well-formed, has a keen blue eye and florid complexion, and displays no small amount of southern bravado in his dress and manners. His gray plush hat is surmounted by a waving plume, which he tosses as he speaks in real Prussian style. He had a letter in his possession from General Stuart, recommending him to the kind regards of General Lee. After making general havoc of railroad stock and rebel stores, we started in the direction of Gordonsville, but having ascertained that a force of rebels much larger than our own occupied the place, we turned northward, and reached our old camp at midnight, having marched upward of eighty miles in thirty hours. Some of us will not forget the ludicrous scenes which were acted out, especially in the latter portion of the raid. 
in consequence of the jaded condition of our horses, it was necessary to make frequent halts. To relieve themselves and animals, when a halt was ordered, some men would dismount, and sinking to the ground through exhaustion, would quickly fall asleep. With the utmost difficulty they were aroused by their comrades when the column advanced. Calling them by their names, though we did it with mouth to ear, and with all our might, made no impression upon them. In many instances we were compelled to take hold of them, roll them over, tumble them about, and pound them, before we could make them realize that the proper time for rest and sleep had not yet come. Others slept in their saddles, either leaning forward on the pommel of the saddle, or on the roll of coat and blanket, or sitting quite erect, with an occasional bow forward or to the right or left, like the swaying of a flag on a signal station, or like the careerings of a drunken man. The horse of such a sleeping man will seldom leave his place in the column, though this will sometimes occur and the man awakes at last to find himself alone with his horse, which is grazing along some unknown field or woods. Some men, having lost the column in this way, have fallen into the enemy's hands. Sometimes a fast-walking horse in one of the rear companies will bear his sleeping lord quickly along, forcing his way through the ranks ahead of him until the poor fellow is awakened, and finds himself just passing by the colonel and his staff at the head of the column. Of course he falls back to his old place, somewhat confused and ashamed, and the occurrence lends him just excitement enough to keep him awake for a few minutes. It is seldom that men under these somnambulic circumstances fall from their horses. Yet sometimes it does happen and headlong goes the cavalier upon the hard ground, or into a splashing mud puddle, while general merriment is produced among the lookers-on. But as no one is seriously injured, the fallen brave retakes his position in the ranks, and the column proceeds as though nothing had happened. We had all these experiences in one form or another in our raid, and on reaching camp, we found that several men had lost their caps by the way. The day following our arrival at camp, the general in command issued his complimentary message, namely, Headquarters of Army, Virginia, Washington, July 21. To Honorable E. M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Sir, the cavalry expedition I directed to General King to send out on the 19th instant has returned. They left Fredericksburg at 7 p.m. on the 19th, and after a forced march during the night made a descent at daylight in the morning upon the Virginia Central Railroad at Beaver Dam Creek, 25 miles north of Hanover Junction and 35 miles from Richmond. They destroyed the railroad and telegraph line for several miles, burned the depot, which contained 40,000 rounds of other musket ammunition, 100 barrels of flour, and much valuable property, and brought in the captain in charge as a prisoner. The whole country round was thrown into a great state of alarm. One private was wounded on our side. The cavalry marched 80 miles in 30 hours. The affair was most successful, and reflects high credit upon the commanding officer and his troops. As soon as full particulars are received, I will transmit to you the name of the commanding officer of the troops engaged. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, John Pope, Major General Commanding. The above order was received with great gladness by the boys of the Harris Light, and Kilpatrick had just reasons to feel proud of his brave boys and their noble deeds. As we had done so well in this branch of business, it was natural for the commanding general to be looking out for more similar jobs for us, and indeed they came. July 24 
Kilpatrick was again launched out with his men on another raid upon the Virginia Central Railroad, which this time we struck at Anderson Turnout. However, we did not reach the railroad before we had surprised a camp of rebel cavalry, with which we had a sharp skirmish on the south bank of the North Anna River. But having the advantage of the enemy, we defeated them, captured their camp, with several prisoners and horses. A large quantity of camp and garrison equipage fell into our hands, which we burned. Unfortunately for us, we did not come just in time to take the cars, but we created an alarm quite as extensive as that which prevailed at Beaver Dam on our former visit. The Richmond Examiner, commenting upon the affair, gave the following truthful rendering. Another scare on the Central Railroad. When the train from the west on the Central Railroad reached Fredericks Hall, a station fifty miles from this, it was met by a rumor that the Yankee cavalry had made another raid from Fredericksburg and had possession of the track at Anderson Turnout, ten miles below Beaver Dam and thirty miles from Richmond. The telegraph wire not being in working order, there was no means at hand of ascertaining the truth of this report. Under the circumstances, the conductor, not choosing to risk the passengers and train, took an extra locomotive and ran down to Anderson's on a reconnaissance. When he reached this place, he found the report of the Yankees at that point correct, but they had left several hours previous to his arrival. He learned the following particulars. At quarter past nine a.m., just a quarter of an hour after the passage of train from Richmond, the Yankee cavalry, several hundred in number, made their appearance at the turnout. Having missed the train, they seemed to have no particular object in view, but loitered about the neighborhood for a couple of hours. They, however, before taking leave, searched the house of Mr. John S. Anderson, which is near the railroad, and took prisoner his son, who is in the Confederate service, but at home on sick furlough. They also took possession of four of Mr. Anderson's horses. They made no attempt to tear up the railroad, having no doubt had enough of that business at Beaver Dam last Sunday. They did not interfere with the telegraph wire through prudential motives, but shrewdly guessing that any meddling with that would give notice of their presence. Of the movements of our troops occasioned by this second impudent foray, it is unnecessary to say anything. The central train reached the city at eight o'clock, three hours behind its usual time. End quote. It is evident that we are greatly embarrassing the rebel traveling public by our raids, destroying public property, capturing prisoners and horses, and gaining some valuable information. We have learned from contrabands and other sources that rebel forces in considerable numbers are being transported westward over this route. Some grand movements are undoubtedly on foot. We have received word that on the 14th, General John P. Hatch, with all his cavalry, was ordered by General Banks to proceed at once upon Gordonsville, capture the place, and destroy all the railroads that center there, but especially to make havoc of the Central Railroad, as far east as possible, and west to Charlottesville. For some reason, General Hatch was too slow in his movements, and General Ewell, with a division of Lee's army, reached the place on the 16th, one day ahead of Hatch. Thereupon, Hatch was ordered to take from 1,500 to 2,000 picked men, well mounted, and to hasten from Madison Courthouse over the Blue Ridge and destroy the railroad westward to Staunton. He commenced the movement but after passing through the narrow defiles of the mountains at Swift Run Gap, he felt that there was no hope of accomplishing anything, and returned. General Pope immediately relieved him from command, and appointed General John Buford, General Banks' chief of artillery, in his place. After some months had elapsed, the following correspondence between General Hatch and his former command will partly vindicate, if it does not fully justify, his course. 
Second Cavalry Brigade, Third Army Corps, near Fort Scott, Virginia, 1862. To Brigadier General John P. Hatch. General, the accompanying saber is presented to you by the officers of the 1st Vermont and 5th New York Cavalry. We have served under you while you commanded the cavalry in Virginia, a period of active operations and military enterprise, during which your courage and judgment inspired us with confidence, while your zeal and integrity have left us an example easier to be admired than imitated. We who have passed with you beyond the Rapidan and through Swift Run Gap are best able to recognize your qualities as a commander. Accept, therefore, General, this testimonial of esteem offered long after we were removed from your command, when the external glitter of an ordinary man ceases to affect the mind, but when real worth begins to be appreciated. On behalf of the officers of the 5th New York, Robert Johnstone, Lieutenant Colonel, 5th New York Cavalry. To the officers of the 5th New York Cavalry and 1st Vermont Regiments of Cavalry. Gentlemen, a very beautiful saber, your present to myself, has been received. I shall wear it with pride, and will never draw it but in an honorable cause. The very kind letter accompanying the saber has caused emotions of the deepest nature. The assurance it gives of the confidence you feel in myself and your approval of my course when in command of Banks Cavalry is particularly gratifying. You, actors with myself in those stirring scenes, are competent judges as to the propriety of my course when it unfortunately did not meet with the approval of my superior, and your testimony so handsomely expressed after time has allowed opportunity for reflection, more than compensates for the mortification of that moment. I have watched with pride the movements of your regiments since my separation from you. When a telegram has announced that in a cavalry fight the edge of the saber was successfully used and the enemy routed, the further announcement that the 1st Vermont and 5th New York were engaged was unnecessary. Accept my kindest wishes for your future success. Sharp sabers and a trust in Providence will enable you to secure it in the field. Your obedient servant, John P. Hatch, Brigadier General. August 5. The Harris Light was again sent out on a reconnaissance to the Central Railroad which we struck on the 6th, about 10 o'clock a.m., at Frederick's Hall. The depot, which contained large supplies of commissary and quartermaster stores, was burned. The telegraph office was also destroyed, with considerable length of wire, while the railroad track was torn and otherwise injured, principally by the fires we built upon it. In a factory near the station were found huge quantities of tobacco. The men took as much as the jaded condition of their horses would permit, and the remainder was wrapped in flames. All this was accomplished without loss on our side. These daring and successful raids made Kilpatrick very conspicuous before the army and country. He was complimented by the general commanding both in orders and by telegraph, and his name became a synonym of courage and success. This gave wonderful enthusiasm to his men, and their devotion to him was unbounded. Wherever he led us we gladly went, feeling that, however formidable the force or dangerous the position we assailed, either by main force we could overcome, or by stratagem or celerity we could escape. This gave our young hero a double power. August 8. Today Kilpatrick was ordered with his regiments to reconnoiter in the direction of Orange Courthouse. He advanced by way of Chancellorsville and Old Wilderness Tavern, 
but on approaching the courthouse we found it occupied by a heavy force of the enemy. It is evident that the rebel army is advancing with a show of fight towards the upper fords of the Rapidan, where, we understand, Generals Buford and Bayard are picketing. After ascertaining all we could about present and prospective movements, we returned to our old camp, having made a swift and tedious march. BATTLE OF CEDAR MOUNTAIN On the ninth was fought the memorable Battle of Cedar or Slaughter's Mountain, in which both sides claimed the victory. The Confederates certainly had the advantage of position, having taken possession of the wooded crest before the arrival of our advance, and they also greatly outnumbered the Union ranks. But their loss was nearly double our own, and nearly the same ground was occupied by the combatants at night, which each held in the beginning of the fight. The cavalry was not conspicuously engaged in this bloody fray, except such portions of it were escort or bodyguard to officers in command and among these some were killed. The main cavalry force watched the flanks, doing good service there. August 10. At an early hour of the day, the Harris Light was ordered to report at Culpeper Courthouse, and we were soon on the march. On arriving at our destination, we found the place well-nigh filled with our wounded from the battle of yesterday. It is estimated that not less than 1,500 of our men were killed and wounded, about a 1,000 of the latter having found a refuge here. The seventh part of the casualties of a battle, on an average, will number the killed and mortally wounded. The others claim the especial tension of their comrades. It is heart-sickening to witness their bloody, mangled forms. All the public buildings and many private residences of this village are occupied as hospitals, and the surgeons with their corps of hospital stewards and nurses are doing their work, assisted by as many others as have been detailed for this purpose, or volunteer their services. The rebel wounded who have fallen into our hands receive the same attention that is bestowed upon our own men many of them acknowledging that they are far better off in our care than they would be among their confederates. These hospitals are all much more quiet than one would naturally suppose. How calmly the brave boys endure the wounds they have received in defense of their beloved country. Only now and then can be heard a subdued sob or a dying groan, while those who are fully conscious though suffering excruciating pain, are either engaged in silent prayer or meditation, or reading a testament, or a last letter from loved ones, and patiently awaiting their turn with the surgeon or the nurse. In the most available places, tables have been spread for the purpose of amputations. We cannot approach them, with their heaps of mangled hands and feet, of shattered bones and yet quivering flesh without a shudder. A man must need the highest style of heroism willingly to drag himself or be borne by others to one of these tables to undergo the processes of the amputating blade. But thanks be to modern skill in surgery and to the discoverer of chloroform, for by these the operations are performed quickly and without the least sensation until the poor brave awakes with the painful consciousness of the loss of limbs, which no artificer can fully replace. Thus the skill displayed and the care taken greatly mitigate the horrors of battle. Men here are wounded in every conceivable manner, from the crowns of their heads to the soles of their feet, while some are most fearfully torn by shells. It had been thought that men shot through the lungs or entrails were past cure, yet several of the former have been saved, and a few of the latter. Indeed, it would seem as though modern science was measuring nearly up to the age of miracles. 
we found that a large force of cavalry was concentrating at Culpeper, awaiting new developments. Reconnaissances are of frequent occurrence, and all of them reveal that the enemy is in motion, concentrating on our front. Our picket lines are made doubly strong, and the utmost vigilance is enjoined. Scouts and spies are on the rampage, and more or less excitement prevails everywhere. IMPORTANT CAVALRY MOVEMENTS AUGUST 16 Today, a, a small detachment of cavalry under Colonel Broadhead of the 1st Michigan Cavalry was dispatched on a scout in the direction of Louisa Courthouse. Having penetrated to within the enemy's lines, and not far from the courthouse, they made a swift descent upon a suspicious-looking house, which proved to be General Stewart's headquarters. The general barely escaped through a back door, as it were, by the skin of his teeth, leaving a part of his wardrobe behind him. His belt fell into our hands, and several very important dispatches from General Lee. Stewart's adjutant-general was found concealed in the house and captured. General Pope, in his official report, speaks of this affair as follows, quote, The cavalry expedition sent out on the 16th in direction of Louisa Courthouse captured the adjutant general of General Stewart and was very near capturing that officer himself. Among the papers taken was an autograph letter of General Robert E. Lee to General Stewart, dated Gordonsville, August 15th which made manifest to me the disposition and force of the enemy and their determination to overwhelm the army under my command before it could be reinforced by any portion of the Army of the Potomac." End quote. Had it not been for the timely discovery of this rebel order, General Pope's army, only a handful to the multitudes which were gathering against him from the defenses of Richmond, would have been flanked and probably annihilated. Assured, however, that reinforcements from McClellan's army could certainly reach him before long, General Pope held his advance position to the last, our pickets guarding the fords of the Rapidan. On the 18th, the entire force of cavalry relieved the infantry pickets, and evident preparations were being made for a retreat. On the day following, a sharp skirmish took place with rebel cavalry, which appeared across the narrow, rapid river. In this engagement, Captain Charles Walters of the Harris Light was killed, and his remains were interred at midnight, just as orders were received to retreat on the road to Culpeper. The cavalry, under General Bayard, is acting as rear guard to our retreating columns. Stuart's cavalry, with whom we are engaged at almost every step, is vanguard of the rebel army, which is advancing as rapidly as possible. The prospect before us is exceedingly dark. Nothing is more discouraging to a soldier than to be compelled to retreat, especially under a general whose first order on assuming command contained the following utterances. Quote, Meantime, I desire you to dismiss from your mind certain phrases which I am sorry to find much in vogue among you. I hear constantly of taking strong positions and holding them, of lines of retreat and bases of supplies. Let us discard such ideas. The strongest position a soldier should desire to occupy is one from which he can most easily advance against the enemy. Let us study the probable lines of retreat of our opponents, and leave our own to take care of themselves. Let us look before, and not behind. Success and glory are in the advance. Disaster and shame lurk in the rear. End quote. We all felt that the moment we begin to turn our backs to the enemy, that moment we acknowledge ourselves either outgeneraled or whipped a thing most disheartening, and to which pride never easily condescends. Our only hope was based on early reinforcements. Should these fail us, we saw nothing but defeat and disaster in our path. 
August 20. While our cavalry forces were feeding their horses on the large plains near Brandy Station, about six o'clock this evening, a heavy column of Stuart's cavalry was discovered, approaching from the direction of Culpeper. Kilpatrick was ordered to attack and check this advance, which he did in a spirited manner. The Harris Light added fresh laurels to its already famous record, and made Brandy Station memorable in the annals of cavalry conflicts. Stuart's advance was not only retarded, but diverted, and it was made our business to watch closely his future movements. On the 21st, we reached Freeman's Ford on the Rappahannock, which we picketed, preventing the enemy from effecting a crossing. As the fords of the river were generally heavily guarded up to this point, the enemy kept moving up the stream toward our right, evidently designing to make a flank movement upon us. On the 22nd, a notable cavalry engagement with light artillery took place at Waterloo Bridge. During this fight, a rebel shell took effect in our ranks, killing instantly the three horses ridden by the three officers of the same company, dismounting the braves very unceremoniously, but injuring no one seriously. Through the darkness of the night following, Stuart, with about 1,500 picked cavalry, effected a crossing of the river, and after making quite a detour via Warrenton, came down unperceived through the intense darkness and the falling rain upon General Pope's headquarters near Catlett Station. He captured the General's field quartermaster and many important documents, made great havoc among the guards, horses, and wagons, and finally escaped without injury to himself, with about 300 prisoners and considerable private baggage taken from the train. His victory was indeed a cheap one, but we all felt its disgrace, which the darkness to some extent explained, but did not fully excuse. August 23. A severe contest occurred today at Sulphur Springs. The enemy is pressing us hard at every crossing of the river, and continues to move toward our right. Skirmishing occurs at nearly every hour of the day and night occasioning more or less loss of life. Yesterday, in a skirmish led by General Sigel, who had crossed the river, General Bolin was killed, and our forces driven back to the north side of the river. While this maneuvering was going on along the Rappahannock, General Lee had dispatched Stonewall Jackson to pass around our right, which he did by crossing about four miles above Waterloo and on the 25th he struck our forces at Bristow Station, where a severe contest took place, the losses in killed and wounded being heavy on both sides. But the enemy was successful in taking possession of the railroad, and in the evening a portion of Stuart's cavalry, strengthened by two regiments of infantry, advanced to Manassas Junction, where they surprised and charged our guards, capturing many prisoners, also ten locomotives, seven trains loaded with immense quantities of stores, horses, tents, and eight cannon. They destroyed what they could not take away. The rebel General Ewell, having followed closely in the track of Jackson, also came upon the railroad in rear of General Pope's army. Our commander, greatly astonished at this embarrassing juncture of affairs, began to make the best disposition of his forces to extricate himself from the toils that had been carefully laid for him, still hoping that new forces would come to his aid from McClellan's army via Alexandria. But hope deferred made his heart sick, and he was compelled to encounter the immense rebel hosts, not only massed on his front, but also lapping on his flanks, and penetrating, as we have seen, even to his rear. The situation was critical in the extreme, and had not the available forces behaved themselves with undaunted courage, and at times with mad desperation, 
the disaster would have been unprecedented. Several unimportant and yet hotly contested battles were fought at Sulphur Springs, Thoroughfare Gap, Bristow Station, etc., and early on the morning of the 29th commenced the Battle of Groveton, by some called the Second Bull Run. The rebels were in overwhelming numbers, though driven badly during the earlier hours of the day, and had Fitz John Porter brought his forces into the action, the victory must have been ours. The cavalry, though quiet most of the day, made an important charge in the evening. The carnage had been terrible, and the fields were strewn with the dead and dying. It is estimated that the casualties would include not less than 7,000 men on our side alone, and it is fair to suppose that the enemy had lost not less than that number. August 30. Our lines, having fallen back during the night, the battle was renewed today on the field of the first bull run. But the fates were again against us, and, though not panic-stricken, our men retired from the field at night, until they rested themselves on the heights of Centerville. The enemy did not follow us very closely, not attempting even to cross Bull Run. On the 31st, General Pope expected to be attacked in his strong position at Centerville, but the enemy was too cautious to expose himself in a position so advantageous to ourselves, where the repulse of Malvern Hill might have been repeated. Quiet reigned along our entire line during the day. Kearney's Death at Chantilly September 1 Becoming aware that a flank movement was in operation, General Pope started his entire army in the direction of Washington. But his army had not proceeded far before one of his columns, which had been sent to intercept the Little River Turnpike near Chantilly, encountered Stonewall Jackson, who had led his weary yet intrepid legions entirely around our right wing, and now contested our farther retreat. General Isaac J. Stevens, commanding General Reno's 2nd Division, who led our advance, at once ordered a charge, and moved with terrible impetuosity upon the foe but he was shot dead on the very first start by a bullet through his head. His command was thereupon thrown into utter disorder, uncovering General Reno's first division, which was also demoralized and broken. Just at this critical moment, General Philip Kearney, who was leading one of General Heinzelman's divisions, advanced with intrepid heart and unfaltering step upon the exultant foe. This was during a most fearful thunderstorm, so furious that with difficulty could ammunition be kept at all serviceable, and the roar of cannon could scarcely be heard a half a dozen miles away. The rebel ranks recoiled and broke before this terrible bolt of war. Just before dark, while riding too carelessly over the field and very near the rebel lines, Kearney was shot dead by one of the enemy's sharpshooters. His command devolved upon General Burney, who ordered another charge, which was executed with great gallantry, driving the enemy from the field, and defeating the great flanker in his attempts farther to harass our retreating columns. But our success had been dearly bought. Two generals had been sacrificed, and Kearney especially was lamented all over the land. Of him the poet sings, quote, our country bleeds with blows her own hands strike. He starts, he heeds, he cries for succor. In a foreign land he dwells, his bowers with luxury's pinions fanned, his cup with roses crowned. He dashes down the cup, he leaves the bowers, he flies to aid his native land. Out leaps his patriot blade. Quick to the van he darts. Again the frown of strife bends blackening. Once again his ear wars furious trump with stern delight drinks in. Again, though the battle bolt in red career, 
Again the flood, the frenzy, and the din. At tottering Williamsburg, his granite front Bears without shook the battle's fiercest brunt. So we have seen the crag beat back the blast. So has the shore the surges backward cast. Behind his rock the shattered ranks reform. Forward, still forward, until dark defeat burns to bright victory. Fame commands the song. We yield it gladly, but the glow fades as we sing. The dire, the fatal blow fell, fell at last. Full, full in deadliest front, leading his legions, leading as his wont, the bullet wafts him to his mortal goal. And not alone war's thunders saw him die. Amid the glare, the rushing, and the roll, glared, crashed, the grand dread battle of the sky. There, on two pinions, wars and storms, he soared. Flight, how majestic, up! His dirge was roared, not warbled, and his pall was smoke and cloud. Flowers of red shot, red lightnings, strewed his beer, and night, black night, the mourner. Now farewell, O hero, in our glory's pantheon thy name will shine, a name immortal one, by deeds immortal in our heart's deep heart, thy statued fame, that never shall depart, shall tower the loftier as time fleets and show how heaven can sometimes plant its titans here below. End quote. General Pope, during all the day and most of the night, hastened his retreat, and on the 2nd of September, his broken and demoralized columns found rest and rations within the fortifications which guard the approaches to Washington. Thus ended General Pope's brief and trying career as commander of the Army of Virginia. Here he resigned his command and was succeeded by General McClellan. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 6 Rebel Invasion of Maryland. 1863 Result of Pope's Campaign. Best and Recruit at Hall's Hill. My Maryland, its invasion. Offensive policy of the rebellion. Pennsylvania and the whole country aroused. Battle of South Mountain. Harper's Ferry. Colonel Miles. His treachery and death. Bloody battle of Antietam. Drilling recruits. The Harris Light again at the front at Chantilly, Sudley Church, Leesburg, McClellan again relieved from command. By the almost continual fighting of General Pope's campaign, our ranks had been greatly depleted. Of the cavalry in general, one correspondent makes the following remark, quote, They picket our outposts, scout the whole country for information, open our fights, cover our retreats, or clear up and finish our victories, as the case may be. In short, they are never idle, and rarely find rest for either men or horses." We had felt the influence of this wear and tear so sadly that our once full and noble regiment was now reduced to about 350 men scarcely one-third of our original number. Nearly every regiment of cavalry which had participated in the misfortunes of the campaign had suffered a like decimation. To replenish our weakened ranks and to infuse new vigor and discipline into the various commands became a question of no little moment. Consequently, a large number of regiments, 
under the direct supervision of General Bayard, were ordered to Hall's Hill, about ten miles from Washington, where we established camps of instruction and drill. During the disasters of the Peninsular Campaign, and the subsequent defeats and retreats from the Rapidan to the Potomac, the country had awakened to the importance of increasing the army by new organizations, and of filling up the broken ranks by fresh levies of recruits. This feeling was greatly intensified by the exposure of Washington to the victorious and advancing enemy, and by the invasions of northern soil, which the triumphs of the rebellion made imminent. Hence, multitudes of recruits were pouring into Washington principally, and into other places, gladly donning the uniform, and eager to learn the duties of the soldier. Camps of instruction were, of course, necessary, and as the attention of young men was turning very favorably to the cavalry service, our camps at Hall's Hill were the scenes of daily arrivals of fine specimens of patriots whose hands were warmly grasped by us, and gladly we initiated them into the mysteries of this new science. We were not a little elated at the epithet of veteran, which these recruits lavished upon us. The experiences and labors of our old camps Oregon and Sussex were repeated with somewhat of new combinations and interests, as we sought to prepare ourselves and others more thoroughly than before to meet the foe in coming campaigns. We had scarcely reached our new camps and entered upon our new labors when we learned that General Lee was marching his confident hosts into Maryland. This movement at first was regarded as a feint only with the intention of uncovering Washington but as column after column was known to have crossed the Potomac and to be advancing through the state with more or less rapidity, the toxin of alarm was sounded everywhere, and a general movement was made to repel the invaders. Pennsylvania was thoroughly aroused, and her loyal and true governor issued a proclamation calling upon all the able-bodied men of the Commonwealth to organize for defense. The militia promptly responded to the call, and military preparations were going on, not only in the old Keystone State, but throughout the land. Up to this time, the attitude of the rebels had been defensive, but their recent great victories had led them to change their tactics, and thinking that ultimate success was almost within their grasp, they now assumed the offensive policy. Aside from this consideration, they doubtless hoped to awaken in the border states a sympathy and an enthusiasm on their behalf, which thus far they had failed to create, and that their brilliant march northward would not only carry a strong political influence, but that their ranks would be greatly swollen by accessions of recruits from those states. This indication of rebel thought is evidently found in the address which General Lee issued to the people of Maryland on the 8th of September. In it are found the following sentences. Quote, the people of the Confederate States have long watched with the deepest sympathy the wrongs and outrages that have been inflicted upon the citizens of a commonwealth allied to the states of the South by the strongest social, political, and commercial ties, and reduced to the condition of a conquered province. Believing that the people of Maryland possess a spirit too lofty to submit to such a government, the people of the South have long wished to aid you in throwing off this foreign yoke, to enable you again to enjoy the inalienable rights of free men, and restore the independence and sovereignty of your state. In obedience to this wish, our army has come among you and is prepared to assist you with the power of its arms in regaining the rights of which you have been so unjustly despoiled. End quote. But the fond hopes which prompted this address were destined to be blasted. Lee's advancing columns met no resistance and marched directly upon Frederick City, 
where recruiting offices were opened under the superintendence of General Bradley T. Johnson, who had left this city at the beginning of the war to serve in the rebel army. But the Confederate chiefs were disappointed. The number who were marshaled under their stars and bars did not exceed the number of those who, tired of training in rebel gray, deserted their banner. The enemy's peaceful march through the state and its quiet possession were not of long duration, and the invaders soon found other work to do than to make political orders and harangues, and to increase their ranks by recruits. From Washington the Union Army began to advance with considerable strength and determination, compelling General Lee to relinquish his design of penetrating into Pennsylvania. Initiatory steps were now being taken for a great battle, the first encounter of which took place under General Pleasanton, who commanded our cavalry during this campaign at the Catoctin Creek in Middletown, Maryland. The enemy's rear guard, consisting of cavalry, was struck with some force, the prelude to the Battle of South Mountain at Turner's Gap. The enemy, having taken possession of this mountain pass, was driven from it only after the most obstinate resistance and severe loss, and was forced to leave only before superior numbers. This occurred on the 14th, and the victory, though somewhat dearly bought, inspired our troops with new courage and gave them a foretaste of better days. Harper's Ferry and Antietam but during the day we received sad tidings from Harper's Ferry, a point of no little importance to the invaders. Unfortunately for us, the place was under the command of Colonel Miles, who, for his drunkenness and general incompetency, had made himself conspicuous during the first battle of Bull Run. Why such a man was left in command of at least ten thousand men, and at a place of so much interest, cannot well be accounted for. Aware as he must have been several days ago that this position was a coveted prize, and would undoubtedly be assailed, he neither retreated nor fortified himself, as he easily could have done, to hold out for a long time against a superior force. Nothing but imbecility or treachery could have controlled his conduct. On the 11th, his command was increased largely by a force under General Julius White, who had evacuated Martinsburg on the approach of Stonewall Jackson. But today he was attacked from various positions, and his forces driven, and on the 15th, being attacked from at least seven commanding positions, early in the day the white flag was raised, which the enemy, failing to see, continued to fire for several minutes, during which time Colonel Miles was killed, some say by a rebel shell, others assert by some of his own men. By this shameful surrender there fell into the hands of the enemy nearly twelve thousand men, half of them New Yorkers, who had just entered the service, also seventy-three guns, good and bad, thirteen thousand small arms, two hundred wagons, and a large supply of tents and camp equipage. Stonewall Jackson, who had commanded the expedition from Frederick to Harper's Ferry, now moved forward to join Lee's main army, which he did on the 16th. From South Mountain, General McClellan began to collect his forces well in hand, and to move towards Boonesboro. Here General Pleasanton again struck the rebel cavalry rearguard, capturing 250 prisoners and two field pieces. Infantry supports were following our cavalry very closely, and after marching about 12 miles, they discovered the rebels in force posted on the south bank of Antietam Creek, just in front of the little village of Sharpsburg. Our troops entered into bivouacs for the night, expecting to attack the enemy early next morning. But the morning and most of the day passed in idleness, while the rebels were fortifying their positions, 
and gathering their forces, which had been more or less scattered. Had McClellan ordered an advance that morning early, the 16th of September, 1862, would have witnessed a comparatively easy and complete victory. At 4 o'clock p.m., General Joseph Hooker was sent out on the right, moving at a sufficient distance to keep out of sight of the rebel batteries. He forded the Antietam, and soon afterwards, turning sharply to the left, came down upon the enemy near the road to Hagerstown. But darkness soon coming on put a speedy end to the conflict. September 17th. This day has witnessed the grand and glorious Battle of Antietam, the particulars of which I need not record. It is enough to say that the daring of our men and their heroic deeds upon this field wiped out forever in rebel blood the disgrace and foul stain cast upon our arms in the momentous military blunders and defeats which have followed us since the beginning of this great American conflict. The losses were heavy on both sides, but the enemy was fairly beaten and driven from his chosen positions, and night closed the most sanguinary day ever known to the American continent. McClellan ought to have followed up his victory early next morning, but hesitating, the enemy made good his escape across the Potomac, leaving only his dead and desperately wounded, the latter numbering about 2,000, in our hands. October 4. We are still in our camps at Hall's Hill, teaching and learning the tactics of war. Today Kilpatrick detailed me to act as drill master and gave me the command of a detachment of recruits. This gives me a new phase of army experience, and though it has its difficulties, as one will always find when he endeavors to control men of many minds, yet I find a good exercise of my little knowledge of human nature, and realize that the influence of my new labor upon myself is very salutary. I had thought that I was master of all the preliminary steps of the science and art of a soldier's discipline, but in endeavoring to teach the same to others, I have learned so much myself that it now seems to me that what I knew before was the merest rudiment. This, I learn, is the experience of others who are engaged in similar work. Helping others has a wonderful reflex influence upon ourselves. I often wonder if this may not explain in part the philosophy of that passage of Holy Writ which says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. In this exercise of drilling, and in the comparative monotony of camp life, we spent the month of October. All was quiet along the entire lines of the great armies. Our ranks had been greatly swollen by new accessions, yet General McClellan was constantly calling for reinforcements, and all kinds of supplies, alleging that the army was in no condition to move. At length, about the 26th of October, a feeble advance was made across the Potomac. Several days were spent in putting the Federal Army on the sacred soil and under marching orders. No opposition was encountered in the march. Our forces moved along the east side of the Blue Ridge, the enemy still occupying the Shenandoah Valley, and moving southward on a line parallel with our own. November 2. The Harris Light broke camp at Hall's Hill, and advanced to the Chantilly Mansion, bivouacking on its beautiful grounds. This property is said to be owned by one of the Stuarts, who is reported to be quartermaster general in the rebel service. Pleasant as was the place, with its fine walks, bordered with flowers and evergreen shrubbery, its fruitful gardens and groves, the cold of the night made our stay not the most agreeable. The next morning we pursued our line of march to Sudley Church, near Bull Run, where we encountered a strong force of Stuart's cavalry. After a sharp conflict, in which Yankee ingenuity and grit were fairly tested, 
the chivalry retired southwestwardly, acknowledging themselves badly defeated. November 4. Today the regiment was ordered to move to Leesburg, near which we pitched our shelters. This is an old aristocratic village, the Shire Town of Loudoun County. It is situated in a lovely valley at the terminus of the Loudoun and Hampshire Railroad, and is only about two miles from the Potomac, and an equal distance from Goose Creek, which is a considerable stream. Though this county sent many brave men into the Union ranks, probably more than any other county of the same population in Virginia, yet Leesburg is almost a facsimile of Charlestown, the capital of Jefferson County, the scene of John Brown's execution, where all the people, including women and children, are, quote, secession to a man, end quote. All this while the Grand Army of the Potomac was moving southward at a snail's pace, and on the 7th of November, just after reaching Warrenton, General McClellan was relieved from command, and directed to report to the authorities by a letter from Trenton, New Jersey. Thus ended another indecisive campaign, which, though it had witnessed a greater victory than ever won before, had yet failed to reap the fruits thereof. End of chapter 6「Seven of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Linebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter Seven McClellan Succeeded by Burnside. Eighteen Sixty Two Burnside's First Campaign. Army of the Potomac in Three Divisions. Advance from Warrenton to Falmouth. General Stale's raid to the Shenandoah. Laying pontoons across the Rappahannock under fire. Battle of Fredericksburg. Daring feats and general heroism. Death of General Bayard. The hospitals. Sanitary and Christian commissions. Camp. Bayard Campfires Winter Quarters Friendly Relations of Pickets Trading Payday Stuck in the Mud Upon General Ambrose Burnside fell the choice of the executive for commander of the great Union Army. He assumed it with great reluctance and unfeigned self-distrust only as a matter of obedience to orders. This change in the commanding officer, deleterious and dangerous as it might be upon the morale of the army, was nevertheless considered necessary and expedient. Having secured by somewhat formidable forces the principal gaps or passages of the Blue Ridge, which had been occupied by the enemy since their advance into the valley, General Burnside began to make preparation to move his army to Fredericksburg, as being the most feasible and direct line from Washington to Richmond. To mask as long as possible his real design, he threatened an attack upon Gordonsville, but General Lee, by the aid of his emissaries and raiders, soon ascertained his plans, and moving his army across the Blue Ridge through the western passes, he took his position on the south bank of the Rappahannock to prevent Burnside's crossing. November 8. The Harris Light broke camp at Leesburg early in the morning and advanced to White Plains, where we encountered and defeated a detachment of rebel cavalry driving them towards the mountains. Continuing our journey through this pleasant valley between the Blue Ridge and the Bull Run Mountains, we soon joined our main army, whose headquarters were at Warrenton. 
This is the most beautiful village in this region of country, situated on the crest of fruitful hills, and elegantly laid out. It is the shire town of Fauquier County. Here a few days were consumed in effecting the alterations incident upon a change of commander, and on the 14th the Army of the Potomac was constituted into three grand divisions, to be commanded respectively by Generals Sumner, Franklin, and Hooker. The following day Warrenton was abandoned, and the army swept down towards the Rappahannock. The site was a grand one. On our march, orders were received from President Lincoln, enjoining a stricter observance of the Sabbath in the army and navy than had been done before. As a general thing, the Sabbath had not been regarded as any more than any other day. Indeed, very few men in the rank and file kept any calendar of time, and seldom knew the date or day. This was occasionally the case even with officers. The only possible way of keeping pace with flying time in the army is by writing a diary. But even when it was known that the Sabbath had been reached, no regard was taken of its sacred character. One of the causes of our disaster at the first battle of Bull Run was supposed by many to be that we had desecrated the Holy Sabbath by our attack. However true or false such a view may have been, the order we received today from Washington was universally felt to be opportune. Two days' march brought our advance to Falmouth, and on the 21st General Patrick, our Provost Marshal General, was directed to repair to Fredericksburg under a flag of truce and request the surrender of the city. The authorities replied that while its buildings and streets would no longer be used by rebel sharpshooters to annoy our forces across the river, its occupation by Yankee troops would be resisted to the last. Had the means of crossing the river been at hand, General Burnside would have made hostile demonstrations at once, but through some misunderstanding between himself and General Halleck at Washington, the pontoons were not in readiness. November 28. A strong force of rebel cavalry under General Wade Hampton dashed across the river at some of the upper fords, raided up around Dumfries and the Okaquan, captured several prisoners and wagons, and returned to their side of the river without loss. As a sort of offset to this, on the 29th, General Julius Stale, who commanded a brigade of cavalry at Fairfax Courthouse, commenced an expedition of great daring and success to the Shenandoah Valley. Having advanced to Snicker's Gap in the Blue Ridge, a strong rebel picket post was captured by our vanguard. Pressing forward on the main thoroughfare, they soon reached the Shenandoah River, and were not a little annoyed by rebel carbineers hidden behind old buildings across the stream. Captain Abram H. Crum, commanding a detachment of the 5th New York Cavalry and leading the advance, dashed across the river, though deep and the current swift, closely followed by his men. Upon reaching the opposite bank, a charge was ordered, and executed in so gallant a manner that several rebels were made prisoners and the remainder of the squad was driven away at a breakneck speed. Our men pursued them in a scrambling race for nearly three miles, when they came upon a rebel camp, which was attacked in a furious manner. Our boys made noise enough for a brigade, though only a squadron was at hand. The enemy attempted a defense, but utterly failed. Reinforcements coming to our aid, the rebels were thoroughly beaten and driven away, leaving in our hands one captain, two lieutenants, thirty-two privates, one stand of colors, and several wagons and ambulances. 
Most of these were laden with booty taken by white guerillas in a recent raid into Poolesville, Maryland. Sixty horses and fifty heads of cattle were also captured in this gallant charge. With all their spoils, the expedition returned via Leesburg, arriving at their camps in safety. But all eyes were turned expectantly towards Fredericksburg, with its two vast armies preparing for a grand encounter. Nearly all the citizens of the city had left their homes and fled southward. While General Burnside waited for his pontoons, General Lee was fortifying the heights in rear of the city and concentrating his forces for the anticipated onset. This state of things was greatly regretted. December 11. The laying of the pontoons commenced in the night, but the task was only partially performed when daylight made the sappers and miners at work a fair mark for the sharpshooters, who were hidden among the buildings which lined the opposite shore, and whose numbers had largely increased within a few days. Battery after battery was opened on Falmouth Heights, until not less than one hundred and fifty guns, at good range, were belching fire and destruction upon the nearly tenantless city, and still the sharpshooters prevented the completion of the pontoons and disputed our crossing. At this critical moment the 7th Michigan Regiment of Infantry immortalized their names. Failing after some entreaty to secure the assistance of the Engineer Corps to row them across, they undertook the perilous labor themselves, and amid the rattling of bullets and the cheers and shouts of our own men, they reached the opposite shore, with five of their number killed and sixteen wounded, including Lieutenant Colonel Baxter. They immediately dashed through the streets of the city, and being quickly reinforced by other regiments, they soon cleared the rifle pits and buildings adjacent to the stream of all annoyance. Foremost among the noble men who performed this heroic work was the Reverend Arthur B. Fuller, chaplain of the 16th Massachusetts Infantry, who was killed by a rifle shot. Our pontoons were now laid in quietness to the city, and about three miles below General Franklin laid his pontoons without opposition. Several bridges were thus constructed, and before night the main body of infantry and cavalry filed across the river, preparatory to a grand engagement. On the 12th, General Bayard moved his cavalry down the river six miles and was posted on picket. Several shots were exchanged with the rebel pickets during the day, and the demon of fight seemed to exist everywhere. December 13. The night had been cold, and the morning was dimmed by a heavy fog which covered friend and foe. But orders for an attack upon the formidable works of the enemy had been given, and even before the mist arose, General Gibbon opened fire with his heavy artillery, which was responded to, but without much effect, owing to the fog which, however, disappeared about eleven o'clock. The engagement now became general, and the fighting was of a character more desperate and determined than ever known before. The line of rebel fortifications was so far back from the river that our artillery, posted on the Falmouth Heights, was out of range, and made more havoc in our advancing ranks than in the ranks of the enemy until the fire was silenced by order of General Burnside. About one o'clock, one of the most brilliant movements of the day was performed by General George G. Meade's division, which by a terrific charge gained the crest of the hill, which was near the key of the position. But not being sufficiently supported, they were compelled to retire, bringing away several hundred prisoners with them. 
Another masterpiece of gallantry was presented nearer the town at Mary's Heights, where General Meagher's Irish Brigade repeatedly charged the rebel works until at least two-thirds of his stalwart men strewed the ground, killed and wounded. Brigade after brigade was ordered to take these heights, and though their ranks were mown down like grass before the scythe, in the very mouth of rebel guns the effort was again and again made. Midway up the heights was a heavy stone wall, behind which lay the hosts of the enemy, who delivered their fire with scarcely any exposure, sweeping down our columns as they approached. This hillside was completely strewn with our dead and disabled, and at length our assailing ranks retired, compelled to abandon their futile and murderous attempts. But in the language of General Sumner, they did all that men could do. This could be applied to all the troops engaged. Night at length threw her sable mantle over the bloody field, covering in her sombre folds the stiffened corpses and mangled forms of not less than fifteen thousand dead and wounded, including the casualties of both armies. Not one of all our dead fell more lamented than Major General George D. Bayard, who was struck by a shrieking shell, dying early in the evening. He was only twenty-eight years of age, of prepossessing appearance and manners, with as brave a heart as ever bled for a weeping country, and a capacity of mind for military usefulness equal to any man in the service. Gradually he had arisen from one position of honor and responsibility to another, proving himself tried and true in each promotion, while his cavalry comrades especially were watching the developments of his growing power with unabating enthusiasm. But death loves a shining mark, and our hero, with his own blood, baptized the day which had been appointed for his nuptials. The recital of his early death brought tears to many eyes, and caused many a loving heart to bleed. Quote, death lies on him like an untimely frost, upon the sweetest flower of all the field. End quote. The night following this bloody conflict was horrible in the extreme. Every available spot or building in the city was sought for a hospital, to which the wounded were brought on stretchers by their companions. Now and then there came a poor fellow who was able to walk, supporting with one hand its bloody mangled mate. At times two men might be seen approaching through the darkness, supporting between them their less fortunate comrade, whose bloody garments told that he had faced the foe. But many of our hospitals proved to be very unsafe refuges into which minnie-balls and broken shells would come rattling, and in some instances destroying the precious lives that had escaped, though not without suffering, the terrible and deadly shock of battle. Many of the wounded were taken across the river, and made perfectly safe and as comfortable as circumstances would permit. The sanitary and Christian commissions rendered very effective service, enshrining themselves in the memory of a grateful people. Their deeds of charity and mercy can never be forgotten. By their timely supplies and personal labors, many lives were saved and thousands of the wounded were comforted. December 14. The light of this holy Sabbath was hailed with gladness by many a poor soldier, who had suffered from the chill of the night alone upon the bloody field. The weather, however, is unusually clement for this season of the year. A little firing occurred this morning, but no general engagement resulted. This was greatly feared, for had General Lee advanced upon us, it is difficult to see how our men, 
though somewhat covered by the fire of our batteries from Falmouth Heights, could have recrossed the stream without fearful loss. But both armies spent most of the holy day in the sacred task of caring for the wounded and burying their dead. Monday was also spent mostly in the same employment, and in the night, so skillfully as to be unknown even to the rebel pickets, our whole army was withdrawn to the north side of the river in perfect order and without loss. Our pontoons were then taken up. General Burnside was not willing to remain totally idle, and after some time had elapsed, he planned another grand movement, which, with more or less opposition from his subordinates, who did not confide in his judgment, he endeavored to execute. But he had just taken the first step in the program when he was signaled to desist by a telegram from the President, who had been informed that the temper of the army was not favorable to a general move under its present commander. With the Battle of Fredericksburg terminated the campaign of 1862, and the two great armies established their winter quarters, facing each other along the line of the Rappahannock. Our camps extend for several miles along the northern shore, above and below Falmouth, and the enemy occupied the south bank above and below the heights of Fredericksburg. Indeed, Nearly the whole territory between the Rappahannock and the defenses of Washington, a dark, forsaken wilderness region, with only here and there a plantation or a village, was soon converted into a vast camping ground, and became the most populous section of Virginia. To avoid the distant transportation of forage, the greater portion of the cavalry is encamped near Belle Plain where government transports land with supplies from Washington. The Harris Light has established its camp on the Bell Plain and Falmouth Turnpike, about four miles from the former place, and has named it Bayard, in honor of our lamented commander, whose fall at Fredericksburg is still a subject of universal sorrow. It is wonderful to witness how the forests are disappearing in and around our camps. From morning till night the chopmen's axes resound from camp to camp, echoing dolefully along the river shore and far back into the dense, dark woods. Soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, as we had no quarters, and nothing but worn and torn shelter tents, our only way to prevent freezing at night was to cut and heap together a large number of logs, which, though green, when fully ignited, made a rousing fire. These fires, numerously built in rows throughout the streets of our camps, presented especially at night a most beautiful and lively scene. The few trees which still remained as shelters were generally lighted up by our fires into grand chandeliers, reflecting upon our white tents a weird light of gold and green, which might have furnished the pen of the romancer and the pencil of the artist their most interesting plots and designs. Around these fires gathered the comrades of many a march and battle, to discuss the experiences of the past to applaud or censure certain men and measures, and to lay plans and to entertain rumors with regard to future operations. The gallantry and merits of companions fallen in strife were presented by those most intimate with them, and otherwise dreary hours were pleasantly whiled away with narratives of personal encounters, of terrible sufferings of prisoners while in the hands of the enemy and of hairbreadth escapes. These accounts were generally enlivened with extra coloring drawn from the enchanting and fairy-like scenes which surrounded the speaker, and an entire group was thrilled and electrified until frequently the night was made to ring with uproarious applause. 
Occasionally the friends and home scenes we have left behind us became the subjects of conversation, and it is astonishing how the word home, with its hallowed associations, touches the tender feelings of our hearts. These colloquies ended with the good old hymn, Home Sweet Home, and with the sound of the last bugle call, we hastened to our rest, to spend, it may be, a miserable night of cold and storm. No soldier can ever forget these camp and bivouac scenes, for they are deeply photographed upon his memory. He will often recall their ludicrous as well as romantic side, when the mud was knee-deep and over, up to within a few feet of the fire, compelling him often to stand so near the burning pile as to set his clothes on fire. In very cold weather he would freeze one side while the other burned, unless he frequently performed that military feat, changing his base of operations. If the wind blew, making his fantastic gyrations among the tents, so that you never knew whence he would come, nor whither he would go, you were sure to get your face smoked horribly. With thousands of camps thus circumstanced, it may be conjectured that no little amount of fuel would suffice us. At first the trees were cut down without much regard to the height of the stumps, but as the forest receded from the camps, making transportation difficult, the stumps were dug up by the roots, leaving the ground perfectly smooth and made ready for the plowmen whenever our swords are beaten into plowshares and our battle-spears into pruning-hooks. And besides the consumption of wood for fires, no little amount is used for the construction of our houses or huts. Nearly every man has suddenly become a mason or a carpenter, and the hammer, the axe, and the trowel are being plied with the utmost vigor, if not with the highest skill. Many of us, however, are astonished at the ingenuity that is displayed in this department. Large logs, notched at the end so as to dovetail together, and sometimes hewn on the inside, compose the body of the hut. By the careful application of mud, that Virginia mortar or plaster with which every soldier is so familiar, to the crevices between the logs, a very comfortable structure is made ready for its covering and occupancy. Shelter tents, buttoned or sewn together, form the roof, which, by the aid of talmus or ponchos, is generally made waterproof. Three or four men usually unite in the construction of a hut, and share one another's skill and stores. If they can afford it, they purchase of the sutlers small sheet-iron stoves, which will keep them very comfortably warm, and afford them an opportunity to do their own cooking on extra occasions, such as come with the issues of supplies from the Christian or sanitary commissions, or the reception of boxes from friends at home. The ordinary cooking of a company is done by men detailed for that purpose. Often good fireplaces and chimneys are erected in the tents. These are sometimes made of sticks of wood laid in thick mud, or of stones or bricks taken from the foundations and remains of buildings that have been destroyed in the neighborhood of our camps. Every means is resorted to which Yankee ingenuity can devise to make our soldier homes as comfortable and convenient as possible. Punch says that a Yankee baby will creep out of his cradle, take a survey of it, invent an improved style, and apply for a patent before he is six months old. And this he said some time ago. What he would say now we cannot tell. If a house has been abandoned by its inmates anywhere within our lines, it is taken as prima facie evidence that the owners must be rebels. 
and it matters but little whether they are or not so long as the house stands alone and in nearly as short a period of time as it takes to tell the story the building is torn in pieces and the materials are used in the construction of our huts and the stables of our horses the dying year left us engaged in these labors january one eighteen sixty three the Harris Light was ordered to the Rappahannock, where we were posted on picket near Port Conway. The Federal and Rebel pickets have mutually arranged that there shall be no firing on either side, unless an advance is undertaken. This agreement is of course among ourselves, neither approved nor disapproved at headquarters. For several days the most perfect harmony has prevailed between the blue and the gray. Yankees and Johnnies wash together in the same stream, procure water to drink and for culinary purposes from the same spring, and, curious to relate, often read the news from the same papers. Squads of soldiers from both armies may be observed seated together on either side of the Rappahannock earnestly discussing the great questions of the day, each obstinately maintaining his views of the matter at issue. On one occasion, a soldier from our ranks took from his pocket a copy of the New York Herald and read the Union account of one of the great battles to an attentive crowd of rebel soldiers. When he had concluded, up sprang one of the chivalry who brought to view a dingy copy of the Richmond Examiner, and proceeded to read his side of the story. No one was offended, and all relished the comparison of views, and then began to discuss the merits of the two accounts. During all these interviews, trading was the order of the day, and a heavy business was carried on in the tobacco, coffee, and hardtack line. There was also a special demand on the part of the rebels for pocket knives and canteens, these articles evidently being very scarce in Dixie. January 12th. The weather has been very uneven since the year began. Wind, rain, sleet, and snow, singly and combined, have been our portion, and as a natural consequence, Oceans of mud have thus far given Camp Bayard a most unwelcome appearance. Our only remedy is to corduroy our streets, which we do by bridging them with the straightest timber we can find. Usually this is pine, with which thousands of acres of Virginia are covered. As it is mostly of a recent growth, averaging about six inches in diameter, and shooting up to an immense height before you can reach the branches, it is well suited to our purpose. Rough as these corduroyed streets are, they are very passable, and prevent us from sinking with our horses into a bottomless limbo. On the 14th of the month, our picket details returned to camp after being several days on duty. The weather is becoming delightful. The sun is often so brilliant and warm that we are compelled to seek shelter in our tents or in the fragrant shades of the woods. We are reminded of pleasant April weather in northern New York. Under this regime of old Saul, the roads are rapidly improving, and should no adverse change occur, we may look for some important army movement. January 21. Today we receive two months' pay, and as is usually the case on payday, the boys are in excellent spirits. Whatever trouble or difficulty the soldier may have, payday is a wonderful panacea, at least if his payroll and accounts are all satisfactory and right. But the men do not all make the same use of their money. Many, on receiving the greenbacks, hasten to Adams Express or dispatch an agent and send home all the money we can spare. 
some repair at once to their tents and enter upon gambling schemes with cards generally or other games and it is no uncommon thing to hear that someone has lost all he had and has gone so far even as to borrow more in less than twelve hours of the time he was paid a small portion of the men visit the sutlers those army vampires whose quarters are converted into scenes of dissipation drunkenness and folly men whose families at home are waiting for means to live thus waste all their wages disgrace themselves and cast their dependence upon the charities of the cold world. January 22 For about two days the army has been prepared for an advance across the Rappahannock. Today the grand movement was commenced. Several regiments, supposing that they never again would need their winter huts, have burned or otherwise demolished them. But the weather, which was fine at the outset, has suddenly changed, and at about ten o'clock at night there poured upon us, untented and unprotected, a furious storm of rain, sleet, and snow, making our condition almost unendurable. We are now left in a bed of almost fathomless mire. None of the men who flounder through these oozy roads, under the inclement sky, will ever forget the muddy march. We had scarcely reached the river shore before we were compelled to return. In one instance, a piece of artillery with its horses had to be abandoned, submerged so deeply in the mud that it was considered impracticable to extricate them. Men are frequently compelled to assist one another, unable to proceed alone. The ground is covered with snow, and yet the mud is so deep that it is almost an impossibility to move artillery or supplies. All our forage and rations are brought from Belle Plaine on horses and pack mules, all wheeled vehicles being entirely shipwrecked. The rebels appear to understand what had been our designs, and know fully the cause of our failure in the expedition. Consequently, to tantalize us, they have erected an enormous signboard on their side of the river, but in full view of our pickets, bearing the inscription, Stuck in the Mud. General Burnside, beset on every hand with misfortunes and disasters, tendered his resignation, but was simply relieved, as at his own request from the command of the Army of the Potomac. End of chapter 7Organization of a Cavalry Corps 1863 General Hooker assumes command of the Army of the Potomac Demoralization Reorganization A Cavalry Corps General George D. Stoneman in command Death of Sergeant May Forests of the Old Dominion the Cavalryman and His Faithful Horse Scenes in Winter Quarters Kilpatrick His Character Qualifications of the True Soldier A New Horse A Mulish Mule Kilpatrick's Colored Servants in Trouble Terrific Hailstorm Major E. F. Cook Honored Colonel Clarence Buell. On the 26th of January, General Joseph Hooker assumed command of the Army of the Potomac. 
whose vicissitudes and defeats have well-nigh broken its spirit and wiped out its efficiency. The patriotic fire is burning dimly in shrines where it has blazed brightly before. The tide of military life has possibly reached its lowest ebb, and the signs of the times are ominous of ill. Desertions are reported to be fearfully large. For this, many of our friends in the North are responsible. Not only do their letters speak discouraging words to the soldier, but many of them sent by express citizens' clothes, with which many of the boys quickly invest themselves, throwing away the blue, and thus disguised find their way to their false friends at home. I esteem him false to me, who would thus rob me of my honor. I would rather say, despoil me of my life, but my integrity never. Discouraging as all this depression of mind and dispersion of comrades may be, many still remain steadfast at their trust, and unflinchingly go ahead in the discharge of their duty. General Hooker's first work seems to be in the direction of checking this loosening of discipline and in reorganizing and strengthening the bands of military order as the infantry needed but little further solidification the commander-in-chief turned his attention to the cavalry in the possible efficiency of this arm of the service the general seems to have full faith but it is currently reported that the general has said that he has yet failed to see or hear of a dead cavalryman. Of course, this cannot be strictly true, for we could cite him multitudes, including our noble Bayard, whose bravery and sacrifice of themselves upon their country's altar are worthy of recognition at the hand of their commander. But it is quite evident that the cavalry has not yet come up to the beau ideal of the general and indeed it has been a source of wonderment to us that while the efficiency of the infantry is known to depend largely upon its organization into brigades divisions and corps with their general commander the same may not be true of the cavalry general bayard the great cavalry chief of the Army of the Potomac during General Burnside's administration, made several efforts at consolidation, resulting, however, in no very permanent changes. It was reserved for General Hooker to bring about the desired result, and at last the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac is organized, with General George D. Stoneman for its commanding officer. By this change, regiments which have been scattered here and there on detached service are brought together, and made to feel the enthusiasm which numbers generally inspire, especially when those numbers are united into a system, with a living head, whose intelligence and authority control the whole. Under this new regime, some very beneficial changes have been wrought. Schools or camps of instruction have been established, with a more rigid discipline than before, and boards of examination, with all the experience of the past before their eyes, have been organized. Old and incompetent officers have been dismissed, or have slunk away before this incisive catechism, giving way generally to intelligent, young, and efficient men who, placed at the heads of regiments and brigades, give promise of success in the struggles that await us. The rebel cavalry, under Stuart, has long been organized into an efficient body, which at times has sneered at our attempts to match them, and yet they have been made to feel, on some occasions, that we are a growing power, which time and experience may develop into something formidable. But the general successes of the rebel army have made them all very insolent, in the hope that final victory is already in their grasp. 
February 11. My old friend and comrade, Sergeant Theodore May, of Pittstown, New York, died this afternoon at two o'clock, after a brief illness of typhoid fever, which is a great scourge throughout the army. The death of this valiant fellow soldier casts a deep gloom over the entire command, in which he has so faithfully served. When we entered the army together at the organization of the regiment, he came a perfect stranger, but his gentle manners and soldierly deportment soon made for him hosts of warm friends. By his gallantry on the field of battle, as well as by the gentleness of his manners and his unblemished conduct in camp, he has won the respect and even admiration of all who knew him. The patriotic motives which induced Sergeant May to quit his pleasant home in the beautiful valley of the Tom Hannock for the privations, hardships, and dangers of military life have always proved him to be a true and warm sympathizer in his country's cause. It was evidently not the mere love of adventure or the mere pageantry or glory of war that led him to make the great sacrifice. He has been with us in every conflict, and shared with us the varied fortunes of the Harris Light. His death, which he would rather have met on the field of strife, battling manfully against traitors, was reserved for the calm and quiet of the camp, where he spent his last moments urging his comrades to cheer up and fight on, offering as his dying reason that our cause is just and must triumph. Such a death is a rich legacy to a command. He being dead yet speaketh. We would emulate his virtues. February 12. On recommendation of Lieutenant Frederick C. Lord, I was today appointed by Colonel Kilpatrick, first sergeant of Company E, Vice Henry Temple, promoted to Sergeant Major. My appointment is to date from the 1st of January, making me a very desirable New Year's gift, which I shall strive to honor. February 22. Snow has been falling uninterruptedly the livelong day, and yet the boys have been unusually merry as they were wont to be on this anniversary before the war. Our celebration has been on a scanty scale, and yet we have felt the patriotic stimulus which comes from the great men and days of the past. And truly, the birth of the great Washington gives birth to many interesting thoughts, especially at this period of our history. A national salute has been fired from our fortifications on the Potomac, and the whole country round about us has been made to reverberate with the sound that welcomes in the day. But all these patriotic manifestations have not prevented the snowstorm and the cold. When we left our home in the north for what was termed the sunny south, we little expected to find such storms as this here. While the summers are much cooler than we expected to find them, the days being generally fanned by a beautiful sea breeze, the winters exceed for cold our highest expectation. The cold is not continuous, but very severe. We have seen the soft ground and water puddles freeze sufficiently in one night to bear a horse and in several days and nights the frost has penetrated the earth several inches deep. The snowstorm of today is as severe as most storms experienced in the north. The wind has howled from the northwest, burdened with its cold, feathery flakes, which tonight lie at least twelve inches deep in places undisturbed. It is such a storm as our suffering pickets, and indeed our entire army, cannot soon forget. 
it may be that the vast forests of virginia have much to do with its peculiar temperature as we travel from place to place we are strongly impressed with the vastness of the wilderness which covers thousands of acres of as fine arable soil as can be found on the continent how different is this from the notions we had formed of the old dominion while reading of its early settlements and of its great agricultural advantages but when we look into its system of land owning and find that one individual monopolizes a territory sufficient for a dozen farms and consequently neglects eleven twelfths of his acres and then look into its even worse system of labor we need search no farther for the causes of this backwardness in agricultural pursuits the implements made use of here on the plantations are such as were rejected by new england farmers over half a century ago and the methods of cultivation are a century behind the times slavery and land monopoly are the incubus who does not sincerely hope that the time is not far distant when the rich acres of this great state shall be properly shared by its inhabitants and when freed from a burden and curse which have long paralyzed their energies instinct with new life and enterprise the people will realize the dignity of labor then will the almost interminable forests disappear and in their stead the industrious yeoman will behold his rich fields of waving grain then too along the now comparatively useless streams and swift watercourses will spring up the factory and the mill whose rolling wheels and buzzing spindles will bring wealth and prosperity to the nation we are convinced from what we have seen that virginia has water power enough to turn the machinery of the world with these changes the schoolhouse will be found by the side of every church and intelligence and virtue will bless the home of the presidents we have also many times been led to think while lying in these chilly woods that a greater warmth would be imparted to the atmosphere if the forest trees were felled and the land put under cultivation a change sufficiently great to be appreciable throughout the state quote, unchronicled heroes end quote. Sunday, March 1. The usual Sunday morning inspection was omitted on account of rain. Rain, rain had fallen for many days almost incessantly. The regiment has been earnestly at work throughout the day in building stables for the horses, which have suffered greatly from being kept standing too long in the mud under these circumstances our horses are afflicted with the scratches many of them so badly as to render them unserviceable and occasionally they lose their lives by this cause and through hard work my little black mare which i drew by lot at camp sussex in the autumn of eighteen sixty one has at last succumbed and with a grief akin to that which is felt at the loss of a dear human friend i have performed the last rite of honor to the dead the indian may love his faithful dog but his attachments cannot surpass the cavalryman's for his horse they have learned to love one another in the most trying vicissitudes of life and the animal manifests affection and confidence quite as evidently as a human being could the cavalier it is true is often compelled to drive at a most fearful rate as when bearing hurried dispatches or making a charge causing almost immediate blindness to the animal or maybe he continues on a march for many days and nights in succession as on a raid averaging at least sixty-five miles in twenty-four hours with little water and less forage 
unable to remove the saddle, which has to be tightly bound, until the animal is so badly galled that the hair comes off with the blanket at its first removal. Sufferings like these often cause the death of a large proportion of a command, and to a careless looker-on these things would appear to be mere neglects. But these cruel military necessities only develop more perfectly the rider's sympathy for his suffering beast, and bind them in closer and more endearing bonds. Some men had rather injure themselves than to have their horses harmed, and the utmost pains are taken to heal them in case they are wounded. Each regiment has its veterinary surgeon, whose skill is taxed to the utmost in his branch of the healing art. Among the most touching scenes we have witnessed are those in which the mortally wounded horse has to be abandoned on the field of carnage. With tearful eyes the rider, and perhaps owner, turns to take a last look of the unchronicled hero, his fellow sufferer, that now lies weltering in his blood, and yet makes every possible effort to follow the advancing column. The parting is deeply affecting. Often the cavalryman finds no object to which he may hitch his horse for the night save his own hand, and thus with the halter fast bound to his grasp he lies down with a stone, or perhaps his saddle for a pillow, his faithful horse standing as a watchful guardian by his side. At times the animal will walk around him, eating the grass as far as he can reach, and frequently arousing him by trying to gain the grass on which he lies. Yet it is worthy of note that an instance can scarcely be found where the horse has been known to step upon or in any way injure his sleeping lord. Such a scene the poet undoubtedly had in his mind when he sang, quote, The murmuring wind, the moving leaves, lulled him at length to sleep with mingled lullabies of sight and sound. End quote. Such experiences as these had taught me to love my faithful and true friend, but I found I was not the only man in the command who was bereaved of his first love. Only a few horses of the original number which we drew still remain, and several of them are either partially or totally blind, though yet serviceable. The hardships of the camp and the campaign are more destructive of animal than human flesh. Men are often sheltered from the storm when the horses are exposed, and the men are sometimes fed when the horses have to go hungry. In battle, the horse is a larger mark than the man, and hence is more frequently hit so that more than twice the number of horses fall in every engagement than men. The cavalryman is more shielded from the deadly missile than the infantryman. The horse's head and shoulders will often receive the bullet which was intended for the rider's body. This is true also of the elevated portions of the saddle, with the rolls of blankets and coats and a bag of forage. A difference has also been noticed between the casualties in cavalry and infantry regiments under equal exposure. This difference is wholly explained when we consider the jolting and swift motion of the man as his horse leaps forward in the fray, making him a very uncertain mark for the enemy. Bright Days March 3 this is the first bright day we have seen in more than three weeks. The mud around our camps, especially in the neighborhood where we water our horses, is terrible, and the roads are almost bottomless. However, long trains of forage and commissary wagons may be seen passing to and fro, with horses and mules in mud from stem to stern. 
Cavalcades of mudded horses and riders traverse the camps and adjoining fields in various directions. Large flocks of crows, the most soldier-like bird in the world, with their high-perched vedettes when alighted, and their military line of march when on the wing, afford some lessons of diversion and instruction. It would seem as if all the ravens of the United States had congregated here, having been attracted by the carrion of battlefields and the refuse of camps. Turkey buzzards, birds which are always on the wing, and that none of us ever yet saw alighted, wheel through the air like eagles, gazing down upon us with seeming defiance. The sights are of daily occurrence. Kilpatrick Today, several details were made from the regiment for brigade headquarters, where Kilpatrick, the senior colonel in the brigade, now commands. In the afternoon, we raised the stars and stripes in front of his tent, after which three cheers were given for the flag and three for the Union. Kilpatrick was then called upon for a speech, and responded in his usually felicitous style. He is certainly an orator as well as a warrior. He speaks, too, as he fights, with dash and daring. What he has to say, he says with such perspicuity that no one doubts his meaning. Frequently there are flashes of eloquence worthy of a Demosthenes. His voice and diction seem to be well-nigh faultless. His speech today elicited frequent outbursts of applause, and the men cheered him enthusiastically at the close and left his quarters with a deeper affection for him than before. Strict as he is to enforce discipline, and thorough, yet he is not severe, and the men love him for his personal attention to their wants, and for his appreciation of their labors. If he gives us hard work to do in march or battle, he endures or shares with us the hardship. If, by the losses of men he has sustained, he is truly entitled to the nickname of Kill Cavalry, which has been quite generally accorded to him, his men know that these casualties have fallen out in the line of duty, in bold enterprises that cost the enemy dearly, the wisdom of which will ever exculpate our loved commander from the imputation of rashness which, by uninformed parties, he is sometimes charged. In preparation for and during a battle, none can excel him. His plans are quickly made and executed, while all possible contingencies seem to have been foreseen. His selection of positions and disposition of forces always exhibits great sagacity and military genius. He generally holds his men under perfect control. His clarion voice rings like magic through the ranks, while his busy form, always in the thickest of the fight, elicits the warmest enthusiasm. His equanimity of mind seems never to be overcome by his celerity of motion, but are equally balanced. Rarely is so great prudence found blended with so undaunted courage. He has an indomitable will that cannot brook defeat. The word impossible he never knows, whatever difficulties intervene between him and duty. He feels like Napoleon, quote, that impossible is the adjective of fools, end quote. Added to all these mental qualifications, is that perfect physique which makes Kilpatrick the model soldier. As an equestrian, we have never seen his superior. He rides as though he had been made for a saddle. Rocks, stumps, fallen trees, brooks, and fences are nothing before him. 
his well-trained steeds understand him perfectly, and are never at a loss to know what is meant by the sharp spurs on their sides, whatever obstacles stand in their path. We have seen him leap over barriers where only few could follow him. To accomplish such feats, the horse must have confidence in the rider, as well as the rider in the horse. While in a charge, Kilpatrick has more the appearance of an eagle pouncing upon his prey than that of a man pouncing upon a man. Then, too, he has a wonderful power of endurance. Though somewhat slender in form and delicate in mould, with complexion and eyes as light as a maiden's, yet it would seem as though his bones were iron and his sinews steel, while the whole is overlaid with gold. He is certainly compactly built. He has undoubtedly his faults, but his men fail to see them, so that to them he is as good as perfect. What so young a champion of the right may yet achieve for his country is a matter of much hopeful conjecture among us. He is now only twenty-five years of age, having had his birth in the beautiful valley of the Clove in northern New Jersey in 1838. He entered the military academy at West Point on the 20th of June, 1856, and graduated with honors in 1860, just in time to be ready for the great conflict then impending. He was present at Baltimore when the mob endeavored to stop the trains for Washington, and the blood of Massachusetts men was spilt upon the streets. He there exhibited that bold intrepidity which has ever characterized his actions. He was wounded at the Battle of Big Bethel, one of the first engagements of the war, where as a lieutenant he commanded Duryea Zouaves, June 11, 1861. He had just recovered from his wound when he entered upon the organization of the Harris Light and became its lieutenant colonel. March 5. We had regimental drill at the usual time this morning. I rode my black pony recently drawn in place of my little black mare, deceased. This was his first experience in cavalry discipline, and I infer that the men in the front rank of the platoon, which I commanded, hoped it might be his last entry, for it must have been most emphatically evident to those who followed him that he was determined to introduce a new system of tactics, in which heels were to go up in no gentle manner at every change of movement. He is certainly the most ungovernable horse on drill I ever mounted, and nothing but long marches and raids can effectually subdue his kicking propensities. I am encouraged, however, with the consideration that such fiery metal when properly controlled and molded, is usually very valuable. The rain fell so fast on the 6th that we were prevented from drill, and recall was sounded immediately after drill call. Sunday, March 8th. Details from the regiment were ordered out on picket. The night had been stormy, but the day has been lovely. At such times, were it not for the mud, we would feel that we are very comfortably circumstanced. On the 11th, in the morning, the ground was covered with snow which had fallen in the night. A brilliant sun soon dissolved the pure mantle and left us in much mire. But our attention was diverted from the going by a novel scene which we were called to witness in camp. The regiment was instructed in the best method of packing a mule, by one who has had experience in the business. The most mulish mule in the whole braying family was selected for the operation, and if we did not have some tall fun I will admit that I am no judge. A hog on ice or a bristling porcupine are bad enough, 
but an ugly mule outstrips them all. It seems as if the irascible animal tried to do his prettiest, flouncing around in a most laughable manner, pawing and kicking at times furiously. But the desperate Yankee teacher was not to be outwitted, and conquered him at last, when the pack was satisfactorily poised, and the ornamented mule was promenaded about camp as in triumph. We are informed that it is the intention of the authorities to have pack mules used in the cavalry corps henceforward in place of army wagons. The reason of this change seems to be to facilitate rapid movements or forced marches. It is the prevailing opinion, however, that the experiment will prove a failure. Too many mules would be required for this purpose and our forage and rations would be very insecure, especially from the storms. But we will see how the thing works. At times it may be expedient. March 12. I had the misfortune to have my quarters burned this morning while getting out a detail for picket. All my extra clothing, equipments, and some little mementos or valuables were speedily converted into ashes. But I immediately went to work, and with some kind assistance, which every brother soldier is ready to bestow, I put up a new establishment which in every respect is superior to the old. Our homes, it is true, are easily destroyed, but they are as easily replaced. March 13. Details from the regiment with pack mules were sent out to the Rappahannock to carry rations and forage to our pickets. The mule train looks oddly enough, and yet through these muddy roads it seems to be a necessity. March 14. Today I am doing regimental guard duty. The guard has been not a little amused by the arrest of Kilpatrick's colored servants. It was their misfortune to be discovered by Captain Southard, the officer of the day, while engaged in a fierce contest in which their heads were used as the chief weapons of attack and defense. The blows they dealt upon each other were most terrible, reminding one of the battering rams of old used for demolishing the walls of forts or cities. Such ancient modes of warfare, of course, could not be tolerated here, especially as no order for battle had been promulgated from headquarters, and the captain arrested the offenders and brought them to the guardhouse, where they were placed in my charge. I immediately ordered them out under guard to police camp as a punishment for their bad conduct. While thus engaged, Kilpatrick happened to see them, and not wishing to have his faithful servant subjected to such humiliating labor, issued an order for their immediate release from Durrance Vile, asserting that he would be responsible for their fighting in the future, if at least they did not put their heads together more than half a dozen times a day. The day following this laughable farce in the afternoon, we experienced one of the most terrific storms ever known in this part of the country. The day had been quite pleasant until about two o'clock, when dark clouds began to obscure the sky, and the wind shifted from the south to the northwest. At four o'clock the elements were ready for battle, and a fierce engagement commenced. Gleaming and forked lightnings cleft the canopy, while booming thunder shook the trembling earth. The artillery of heaven had not long been opened before the musketry commenced, and down poured a shower of hail, which came near demolishing our tents, and brought suffering and sorrow upon all unsheltered heads. Mules brayed horribly, vying with the hoarse muttering thunder making the camp most hideous and lonely. 
The wind and cold increased with every passing hour. The hail fell faster and more heavily, and night came suddenly down to hide, though not to prevent, the storm. The night was one of great suffering, especially on the lines of picket. It was bad enough anywhere. March 23. A beautiful saber was presented to Major E. F. Cook this afternoon by the members of his old company for his gallantry and soldierly character, which have earned his promotion. Captain O. J. Downing of Company B made the presentation speech, in which he beautifully alluded to the happy relation which always exists between a faithful commander and his men. As a token that such relation existed between the Major and those whom he had often led through perilous scenes and conflicts, their gift was presented. An appropriate response was made by the Major, in which he very humbly attributed his military success thus far to the bravery of the noble men who had always stood by him and whose gift he accepted not only as a mark of their appreciation of himself as a man, but of their devotion to the cause which he hoped, by the edge of the sabre and trust in Providence, we may yet win. March 24. Kilpatrick's brigade was reviewed this morning by General Gregg, who commands the 2nd Division of the Cavalry Corps. Kilpatrick commands the 1st Brigade, which is composed of the 1st Maine, the 10th New York, and Harris Light. On the 25th, General Gregg again reviewed us. We were ordered to turn out in heavy marching orders, that is, with all our clothing, rations, forage, or grain, and fully equipped. For some reason, inspections and reviews are frequent of late. The Harris Light maintains its established reputation as being second to none in the Corps for its efficiency in drill and discipline and in its general appearance. The men take pride in keeping up the morale of the regiment. March 28th. Colonel Clarence Buell is paying us a visit today. This gallant and noble officer who organized and formerly commanded the Troy Company of the Harris Light, has recently been promoted to the colonelcy of the 169th New York Infantry. The colonel has taken temporary leave of absence from his new command for the purpose of making us a friendly call, and he is again surrounded by his old tried friends and comrades. Company E hails with pleasure its former loved captain, and though sad at his loss, still rejoices in his well-earned and merited promotion. All the men of the company showed their respect and admiration for him by falling into line upon the announcement of his arrival in camp, and thus greeted the Christian soldier. It was a very delightful and enjoyable occasion. As a soldier, Colonel Buell stands among the bravest and the best. Always attentive to the wants of his command, his men are always the last to be out of supplies of rations or clothing. He generally exercised that fatherly care over us, which called forth in return a filial love. He is dignified and yet perfectly affable. As a commander, he is intrepid and cool and manages his troops with admirable skill. He possesses a naturally well-balanced mind, thoroughly cultivated, and a heart always full of Christian hopefulness and benevolence. We wish him great success in his new field of labor and responsibility. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 9. Rebel Chiefs and Their Raids. 1863. Rebel Raids by Stuart, Imboden, and Fitzhugh Lee. John S. Mosby, Guerrilla Chief. His Character. His Command. Daring and Plunder. Aided by Citizens. Condition of the country favorable for their depredations. Our picket lines too light. Attacks on pickets at Herndon Station, Cub Run, and Frying Pan Church. Miss Laura Ratcliffe, Mosby's informant. Mosby at Fairfax Courthouse. Capture of General Stoughton. Fight at Chantilly. Mosby lauded by his chiefs. Mosby beaten at Warrenton Junction. Severely whipped at Greenwich, where he loses a howitzer captured from Colonel Baker at Ball's Bluff. The rebel cavalry has been active all winter, as may be seen by the many raids which they have made, beginning as far back as December 25th, when their chief, J. E. B. Stewart, anxious to obtain something suitable with which to celebrate the holidays, crossed the Rappahannock, advanced on Dumfries, where it would seem that our boys, freezing dumb, Dumfries, suffered the raider to capture not less than twenty-five wagons and at least two hundred prisoners. Moving boldly northward, he struck the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, burning the bridge across the Akatink Run, and from Burke Station he swung around Fairfax Courthouse and returned by long, circuitous route into their lines with their hard-earned spoils. A lull of operations followed this bold holiday enterprise until the 16th of February, when a party of General John D. Imboden's Rangers in the Shenandoah Valley made a rapid raid to Romney farther west, where they captured several men, horses, and wagons, having taken our forces entirely by surprise. The success which characterized these forays was not only disgraceful to ourselves and very disheartening, but it gave the rebels an audacious effrontery and malignant boldness, which led them into more frequent and reckless movements. But our men were a little more on the alert, and thus averted, to a great extent, the injury which was intended. February 25. Today, Fitzhugh Lee, almost in the very face of our pickets, crossed the Rappahannock near Falmouth, attacked by surprise a camp, where he captured one hundred and fifty prisoners, but was not able to return without some loss. The next day, General W. E. Jones marched with a brigade into the valley, attacked and routed two regiments of General Milroy's cavalry, and with slight loss from his command, escaped with about two hundred prisoners. The most daring, however, of all these raids was made by Major White, with his band of Loudoun County Rangers, which differs not much from guerrillas, into Maryland, where they captured a few prisoners, but spent most of their time and strength in plunder. Poolsville was the scene of their depredations. It did seem as though nearly every rebel cavalry officer had been touched with a magic wand, which filled him with the most weird and romantic views of warfare, and led him into enterprises almost as wild as any of Dick Turpin's. Fauquier County was the theater of several of these movements by Captain Randolph of the Black Horse Cavalry. And in these days appeared another partisan, whose name for the first time flashes out in big capitals in the official as well as other bulletins, amid most startling maneuverings. It is John S. Mosby. To the Harris Light, this gentleman was not wholly unknown, 
and we distinctly remember the time when he was a prisoner in our hands. It appears that he was then sent to Old Capitol Prison at Washington. Not long thereafter he was released, and, being bent on revenge, and naturally fitted for guerrilla operations, he soon received permission from his chief to operate on an independent plan. This Mosby, as we have been informed by an acquaintance of his, a rebel soldier who has known him from early life, has always been a sort of a guerrilla, deserting from his father's house in mere boyhood, fighting duels as a pastime, roving the country far and wide in search of pleasure or profit, a thorough student of human nature and of the country in which he operates, bold and daring to a fault and romantic in his make, and finding now his chief delight in the adventures of guerrilla life. His commission is a roving one, and his command seems to be limited neither to kind or number. Many of his men are citizens, who spend a portion of their time in their ordinary business, and who hold themselves in readiness for any movements indicated by their commander-in-chief. Occasionally he is accompanied and assisted in his forays by daring men from various commands, who are at home on leaves of absence or furloughs, while a few seem to be directly and continually under his control. The principal stimulus of the entire party, except the bad whiskey which they are said to use, is the plunder which they share. It is their custom at times to parole their prisoners and send them back to our lines, though often, when large numbers are taken, they are sent to Richmond. But all horses and equipments, which now command enormous prices in Dixie, are the property of the captors. The region of the country they have chosen for their operations is certainly well adapted to facilitate their designs. Deep ravines traverse the country, skirted with dense, dark foliage, which affords them shelter, and through which they pass like so many wild turkeys or wild boars, knowing, as they do, all the roads and by-paths. Indeed, some of their parties are dwellers in these regions, and are acquainted with every nook and corner, where they can hide securely with their prey and elude their pursuers. When the immediate neighborhoods of their depredations do not offer a sufficient asylum, they fly to the fastnesses and caverns of the Bull Run Mountains. Then, too, there is a certain degree of carelessness on the part of our own men, which merits censure and causes trouble. For instance, they frequently call at the homes of bitter rebels for the purposes of pleasure, or to get articles of food, which they purchase or take, and while at these places they are too free to talk about the condition of our army, the position of our picket lines and posts, etc., information which is grasped with wonderful avidity and as readily transmitted to Mosby and his men. Scarcely does any important event transpire among us that is not fully understood immediately by the rebel families within our lines, and is very easily borne to those outside the lines between two days. Thus, movements even in contemplation have been heralded before the incipient steps had been taken, and consequently thwarted. Our only safety from this source of trouble would be to drive out of our lines all rebel families, thus preventing the means of communicating the news to the outer world. Another simple statement will explain the chances of the enemy and the causes of many of our casualties. Our picket lines are too much extended, covering too wide a territory to make them as strong as they should be. Only a brigade is doing the work of a division and consequently the picket posts are not sufficiently near each other. Thus, in the night, it requires no very great dexterity to creep through the bushes between the pickets unobserved, 
and once within our lines, any amount of mischief may be done by the miscreants. The method indicated here is usually the one employed by these active guerrillas, and it forms the chief stratagem of all their movements upon us. Their first important attack upon our pickets took place on or about the 10th of January. A small federal picket was doing duty at Herndon Station on the Loudoun and Hampshire Railroad. Mosby determined to effect their capture. Led by a skillful guide, he dismounted his command some distance from the picket lines. Then they all crept cautiously between the vedettes until they reached the rear of the post, and from that direction advanced upon the unsuspecting boys, whose forms could be distinctly seen by the flaring light of their bivouac fire. While the pickets were thus a fine shot and mark for the enemy, the attacking force was concealed perfectly by the darkness of night and the shades of the thick pines. A pistol shot from the guerrillas was followed by a charge, when our boys were suddenly surrounded and captured. This attack and capture was followed by another similar enterprise a few nights afterwards at Cub Run, near the Little River Turnpike. The picket relief was captured by a charge made in their rear, and only the two vedettes made their escape. Later in the same night, a similar assault was made upon our post at Frying Pan Church. Not far from this church resides a Miss Laura Ratcliffe, a very active and cunning rebel who is known to our men, and is at least suspected of assisting Mosby not a little in his movements. The cavalry brigade doing picket duty at this point is composed of the 1st Virginia, many of whose men were raised in these parts, the 1st Vermont, the 5th New York, and the 18th Pennsylvania. The latter of these regiments has but recently been mustered into the service, is poorly drilled and worse equipped, and is by no means fitted to picket against so wily a foe as Mosby. Though great caution is exercised by Colonel Percy Wyndham, who is in command of the brigade to arrange and change the alternation of the pickets so that the regiments to picket at any given point may not be known beforehand yet by means of miss ratcliffe and her rebellious sisterhood mosby is generally informed of the regiment doing duty and his attacks are usually directed against the unskilled and unsuspecting Having approached under cover of the night above alluded to, within a few hundred yards of the pickets, whose position and strength he knew very well from information received by the neighbors, the horses were left in charge of one man, while the party skulked along through the thick underbrush until they could approach the post from the direction of the Union camp. The picket relief was mostly quartered in an old house nearby with a single sentinel stationed at the door. Seeing the Mosby party approaching, he supposed that they were a patrol, and consequently allowed them to come within a few paces of the house before he challenged them. But it was now too late, and springing forward like panthers, the guerrillas presented their pistols at his head, ordering a surrender. The house was immediately surrounded, and the assailants began to fire through the thin weatherboarding upon the men shut up within. This fire, however, was vigorously returned for a time, but yielding at last to superior numbers, who had greatly the advantage, the whole party was compelled to surrender. The success with which Mosby carried on his operations made him a sort of terror to our pickets while it attracted to him from all quarters of rebeldom a larger and more enthusiastic command. They became wonderfully skilled and bold, as may be seen by the following daring exploit. On the night of the 8th of March, during rain and intense darkness, 
Mosby led a squadron of his conglomerate command through the pines between the pickets near the turnpike from Centerville to Fairfax Courthouse. Striking through the country, so as to avoid some infantry camps, he soon reached the road leading from Fairfax Station to the courthouse. Moving now with perfect confidence, as no pickets along this route would suspect the character of such a cavalcade several miles inside our lines, about two o'clock in the morning he entered the village and began operations. The first thing was to capture the pickets stationed along the streets in a quiet manner, so as to arouse no one from their slumbers, and this was easily accomplished. The way was now fully open to the Confederate band. Divided into parties, each with its work assigned, they quickly accomplished the mischief they desired. Mosby, with a small band, proceeded to General Stoughton's headquarters in the house of a Dr. Gunnell. Dismounting, he soon stood knocking at the door. A voice from an open window above demanded their business at such an unseasonable hour. "'Dispatches for General Stoughton,' responded Mosby. The door was quickly unlocked, and the guerrilla chief stood by the bedside of the sleeping general, who had but a few moments before retired from a dancing and convivial party. Fancy now the reenactment of the scene in old Ticonderoga Fort, when Ethan Allen, by stratagem, stood in the presence of His Majesty's sleeping commander. Stoughton was soon apprised of the character of his nightly visitors, and quickly making his toilet, he was hurried away with a portion of his escort, and several other prisoners, including Captain Augustus Barker, of the 5th New York Cavalry. Fifty-eight of the finest horses from the officers' stables were also captured, and Mosby retraced his sinuous route through our lines of pickets so rapidly that he escaped all pursuers. The morning light of the ninth of March revealed the boldness and success of the raiders, and no little excitement prevailed. Several parties of cavalry were ordered out in pursuit of the flying partisans, but all returned at night unsuccessful. This was an occasion for great humiliation on the part of our troops stationed about the courthouse, while in Washington and throughout the nation not a little humor was drawn from the remark made by the President when someone told him of the loss we had sustained. Yes, he characteristically replied, that of the horses is bad but I can make another general in five minutes. Suspicious that rebel citizens within our lines were more or less implicated in this and other raids, quite a number of arrests were made among them, which cleared the country of the most flagitious cases. However, it is very probable that some innocent ones were made to suffer, while the most guilty were allowed to escape. March 23 the pickets near Chantilly had been quiet for several days, but toward night a company of cavaliers, mostly dressed in blue uniforms, emerged from a piece of wood within a mile of the Chantilly mansion, and moved directly toward the picket post stationed near a small run on the Little River Turnpike. The picket, supposing them to be Union troops, watched their approach without suspicion and when they had come within a few feet of him, they introduced themselves by shooting him through the head. The alarm being thus given, the nearest reserve made a sudden descent upon the attacking party, which proved to be Mosby's, and the guerrillas retreated for some distance up the turnpike, closely pursued. Having followed them about three miles, they came to a barricade of trees which had been fallen across the road, Back of this obstruction, Mosby had formed a large part of his command, and our column was stopped by a heavy fire from carbines and pistols in their front, 
and also by a flank fire from the woods. At this inopportune moment, Mosby made a charge which broke our column. The boys were driven back at a furious rate, and had not strength to rally. Some horses giving out, the hapless riders were captured. But as rebels and Yankees were uniformed much alike, it gave some of our boys an opportunity for stratagem. For instance, one of our fellows, finding himself overtaken by the enemy, began to fire his pistol in the direction of his flying comrades, with care not to harm them, but with sufficient vim to be taken by the enemy in their haste as one of their number. In this way they passed him by, and he effected his escape. This scrambling race continued for about three miles, back to the ground where the affair commenced, when our men were reinforced by the reserve from Frying Pan Church. The Mosbyites were now compelled to halt, and a charge made upon them drove them back up the pike. They were pursued several miles, but night came on and our men were compelled to return. Three of our men were killed, and about thirty-five were taken prisoners, including one lieutenant. Several horses were also taken away. The enemy suffered no appreciable loss. Mosby's plans were certainly made with great wisdom and forethought, and executed with a dash and will which were at times very astonishing. His men must have been warmly attached to him as their leader, while the gain they made by their plunder greatly increased their zeal. The command was truly unique in its leader, its composition, and its modus operandi, while its results, assisted as they were by the topography of the country, and the rebel sympathizers within and just without our lines, attracted no little attention. The orders of General Stuart, and even those of General Lee, associated the name of Mosby with consummate daring and continual success stimulating the band to greater deeds. We append one specimen of those orders, furnished us by one of their own number, quote, Headquarters, Cavalry Division, Army of Northern Virginia, March 27, 1863. Captain, your telegram, announcing your brilliant achievements near Chantilly, was duly received and forwarded to General Lee. He exclaimed upon reading it, I wish I had a for Mosby. Like him. I wish I had a Heartily wishing you continued success, I remain your obedient servant, J. E. B. Stewart, Major General Commanding, Captain J. S. Mosby Commanding, etc., etc. But it is not often permitted one man always to prosper in his enterprises and even the wonderful Mosby was destined to meet equals, and to be worsted in engagements. Later in the season, while General Stale's cavalry division was picketing the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, Mosby made a sudden descent one morning upon the 1st Virginia Cavalry at Warrenton Junction. Unfortunately, these Union Virginians, who were one of the best regiments in our service, were just then unprepared for any such maneuvering. They had just been relieved from duty and were taking their rest. Many of the men were lounging about under the shade of trees or quartered for the time in a few block buildings situated in an angle formed by the two railroads. Their horses were mostly unsaddled and unbridled, and hence not fit for a fight, while many of them were grazing loosely and quietly in the adjoining fields. Mosby advanced upon them from the direction of Warrenton, was at first mistaken for a squadron of our own cavalry, which had been sent out on a scouting expedition. The error was soon corrected by a fierce charge made by the guerrillas. Such of the men as were roaming about the premises, mostly unarmed, 
of course immediately surrendered, but about one hundred of them fled for refuge in one of the largest buildings, resolved to sell themselves, if it came to that, at the dearest price. And now commenced a fearful struggle. The Confederates would ride up near the windows and discharge their pieces at the men within, while the brave fellows inside, commanded and inspired by Major Steele, one of the bravest of the brave, defended themselves with a noble determination. All efforts of Mosby to make them surrender were in vain. Finding at last that he could not intimidate them with bullets, he ordered the torch to be applied to a pile of hay nearby, and the house was set on fire. Just at this juncture of affairs a strong party of Mosby's gang, having dismounted from their horses, rushed against the door of the building with such force as to burst it open. Surrounded now by flames, which were spreading rapidly, and attacked with desperation by the foe, the whole party was compelled to surrender. Flushed with success, the guerrillas were making preparations to retire from the field with their booty, when the 5th New York Cavalry, which had been bivouacked in a grove not far from Cedar Run Bridge, arrived at the junction whither they had been attracted by the firing, and immediately fell upon the foe like an avalanche. Major Hammond commanded in person. Mosby was heard to exclaim, My God, it is the 5th New York! A hand-to-hand -hand encounter now took place, in which bravery was fired with desperation, and Yankee sabers were used with fearful effect. The rebels soon broke and fled in every direction, demoralized and panic-stricken, leaving behind not only the captures they had made, but many of their own number. Some rebel heads were fearfully gashed and mangled, one of them exhibiting his lower jawbone not only dislocated, but almost entirely severed with one determined blow from the strong hand of a cavalryman. General Stale, in his dispatch to General Heintzelman, says, quote, The rebels, who fled in the direction of Warrenton, were pursued by Major Hammond, 5th New York Cavalry, who has returned, and reports our charge at Warrenton Junction as being so terrific as to have thoroughly routed and scattered them in every direction. I have sent in twenty-three prisoners of Mosby's command, all of whom are wounded, the greater part of them badly. Dick Moran, a notorious bushwhacker, is among the number. There are also three officers of Mosby's. The loss of the enemy was very heavy in killed, besides many wounded, who scattered and prevented capture. I have no hopes of the recovery of Major Steele of the 1st Virginia. Our loss is one killed and fourteen wounded. End quote. Templeman, one of Stonewall Jackson's best spies, was killed, and the partisans confessed themselves thoroughly whipped. They were wont to call this their first retreat, in which they did some tall running. The following complimentary order was issued quote, Headquarters, Stales Cavalry Division. Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia, date blank, 1863. Special Orders Number 80 When soldiers perform brave deeds, a proper acknowledgment of their services is justly their due. The commanding general, therefore, desires to express his gratification at the conduct of the officers and men of Colonel DeForest's command who were engaged in the fight at Warrenton Junction on Sunday, date blank, 1863. By your promptness and gallantry, the gang of guerrillas who have so long infested the vicinity has been badly beaten and broken up. The heavy loss of the enemy in killed, wounded, and prisoners proves the determination of your resistance and the vigor of your attack. 
Deeds like this are worthy of emulation, and give strength and confidence to the command. By command of Major General Stale. End quote. Thoroughly as Mosby had been whipped on this occasion, and diminished as was his command, it was not long before he was again heard from. It must be confessed that he possessed remarkable recuperative powers. His qualities of heart and mind seemed to attach his men to him peculiarly, while his mode of warfare was calling many young and daring Virginians to his standard. By this means his numbers were soon recruited, and he was again on the rampage. At this time, the government was sending supplies to the army on the Rappahannock via the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Each train was in charge of a guard, and all the principal bridges and exposed places on the route were under pickets. Besides this, frequent patrols were sent from one picket post to the other, so that the entire road was under a close surveillance. One morning, between seven and eight o'clock, the cavalry pickets and reserves about Catlett's Station were startled by artillery firing just below them on the railroad. A train laden with rations and forage had just passed on its way to the Rappahannock. It was soon ascertained that during the night the guerrillas had carefully unfastened one of the rails in the woods, and by means of a wire attached to it, and extended some distance from the road, in a manner to be unobserved by the patrols, a man concealed behind a tree had drawn the rail out of place just as the engine was approaching it, throwing it off the track. A mountain howitzer, which had been placed in position, immediately plunged a shell through the engine and at the same time a charge was made upon the guard. This consisted mostly of men whose term of service expired that very day, and their resistance amounted to nothing. They soon fled in shameful confusion, leaving the ground to the rebels, who, after taking such plunder as they could carry, fired the train, and then started on the road to Haymarket. But the cavalry had been aroused, and detachments of the 1st Vermont and 5th New York, each in separate routes, commenced a vigorous pursuit. Mosby, who commanded in person, evidently had not reckoned on so sudden and sharp an encounter. He had not proceeded two miles before he espied the boys in blue eagerly flying after him. His howitzer was quickly brought into position, and a shell was accurately thrown among his pursuers, suddenly dismounting one of the officers whose horse was killed. But the detention of the column was only temporary, the boys being determined once more to cross sabres with the chivalry. The nature of the ground was unfavorable for a cavalry charge, and the enemy showed no disposition to fight but fled as rapidly as possible, firing an occasional shell, but without inflicting any injury. Eagerly the boys spurred on their chargers, and were soon joined by the Vermonters, who added fresh excitement to the chase. Mosby, finding himself too closely followed for his comfort, and knowing that something desperate must be done, determined to sell his howitzer as dearly as possible. Having reached the head of a narrow lane near the house of a Mr. Warren Fitzhugh, he wheeled the piece into position and commenced a rapid fire. There was no way for our boys to reach the howitzer except through the lane, the whole length of which was raked by every discharge. "'That gun must be captured,' exclaimed Lieutenant Elmer J. Barker of the 5th New York and who will volunteer to charge it with me? About thirty brave fellows responded promptly, and suiting the action to the words, Charge, boys! He rushed furiously forward at their head, while the fields rang with their maddening yell. But the brave lieutenant fell severely wounded before a murderous discharge of grape and canister, 
which killed three of his men and wounded several. The lieutenant's faithful horse was also mortally wounded. But before the piece could be reloaded with its only one remaining shell, the surviving comrades were crossing sabres with the gunners over the gun. The conflict here was desperate, but of short duration. Mosby's lieutenant, Chapman, fought with the rammer of the gun, but fell wounded and was captured. At length those who could not escape surrendered, and the howitzer was ours. It bore an inscription which showed that it had been captured by the rebels from the lamented Colonel Baker at Ball's Bluff. Among the enemies wounded and captured was a Captain Hoskins, formerly of the British Army, who had run the blockade and espoused the rebel cause. He received his death wound as follows. Having wounded a private soldier in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, he roughly cried out, Surrender, you damn Yankee! I'll see you damned first, was the characteristic reply, while the Yankee boy lodged a pistol ball in the captain's neck, from which he did not long survive. An interesting diary was found in Captain Hoskins' possession, describing mainly his private life since entering Mosby's command. Mosby himself barely escaped being captured on this occasion, and he carried the mark of a sabre cut on his arm. The fight had been desperate on both sides, but the guerrillas were badly worsted, and driven away as far as the jaded condition of our horses would permit us to pursue them. In their flight the spoils, which had been taken from the captured train, were left behind, strewn in every direction. This fight occurred near the little village of Greenwich, and gave Mosby a blow quite as severe as any he had ever received. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10, Part 1 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 10, Part 1 Chancellorsville and Stoneman's Raid. 1863 Review of the Army by the President. Deserters punished. Sports and pastimes. STONEMAN'S FIRST MOVE STORM RECONNAISSANCE TO WARRENTON ANOTHER MOVE OTHER STORMS CATCHING RABBITS STONEMAN'S GREAT RAID ON LEE'S COMMUNICATIONS ON THE VIRGINIA CENTRAL RAILROAD APRIL 1 April Fool Day always brings its trains of fun and broods of annoyances, the boys being determined to make the most of it. The usual plan is to induce a comrade to believe that either the colonel, his captain, or lieutenant wants to see him. This scheme is generally successful, for the victim dare not refuse to report whenever called for and as he is unable to learn whether he is really wanted or otherwise, he finds it necessary to call upon his superior to ask his pleasure. Receiving the assurance that nothing is wanted of him, he sees that he has been sold, and returns to his comrades in the midst of their hilarity at his expense. But he is generally determined to have revenge and to get the laugh on them before the day is spent. Sometimes these jokes are carried rather too far for sport, and recoil upon their perpetrators with unpleasant force. But then this soldier life of ours is so grave and solemn that our buoyant natures seek relief in all such means as the above. The bow, always bent to its utmost tension, would soon break 
or become useless. It must be straightened to send the arrow. So our natures would break were they not elastic, and were there no opportunities for reaction as well as action. Then, too, there is a kind of monotony to our life in winter quarters, to which it is difficult to accustom ourselves. And he who can suggest anything laughable is a great benefactor to his comrades, for then the monotony is broken, and we enjoy a little sprinkling of variety, which is truly said to be the spice of life. A good joke that runs through the command like a bubbling brook along the flowering meadows is worth more to us than a corps of nurses with cartloads of medicine. On the 2nd of April, from 9 to 11 o'clock in the morning, we had a mounted brigade drill. Colonel Kilpatrick was in command. He appeared well pleased at the close with the proficiency of his men, and they are all enthusiastic over him. There seems to be a wonderful unanimity of feeling in the brigade, all regarding Kilpatrick as the right man in the right place. April 6. Today the Cavalry Corps, consisting of twenty-five regiments, well filled and drilled, was reviewed by President Lincoln and Generals Hooker and Stoneman. A salute of twenty-one guns was fired upon the arrival of the presidential party. The review took place on Falmouth Heights, in full view of the rebel encampment in rear of Fredericksburg. The scene we presented to our enemies must have been grand, for we appeared in our best uniforms and with flying colors. It was an occasion not to be forgotten, the sight being one of the most magnificent many of us ever saw. The column was between three and four hours passing in review. It seemed to do us all good to get a glimpse of the solemn, earnest face of the President, who reviewed us with apparent satisfaction. April 7. Picket details returned from the river today. In the afternoon, several horse races came off near our camp, between the 1st Pennsylvania, the 1st New Jersey, and Harris Light. One of Kilpatrick's favorite horses was badly beaten, much to his mortification, owing, as was alleged, to the stupidity of the rider, who was sent off the ground in disgrace. We are frequently training our horses for swift motions, and teaching them to jump ditches and fences. These are occasions of excitement and amusement. Men are frequently thrown from their horses while endeavoring to jump them beyond their ability, though seldom is anyone hurt. Much practice is necessary to make perfect in this exercise. The papers bring us good news of a great Union victory in Connecticut. Such victories, though bloodless, have a powerful influence upon the rank and file of the army. Every ballot cast to sustain the administration is equal to a well-directed bullet against the foe. April 8. The brigade was called out this morning on the old drill ground to witness a somewhat sad and novel scene, namely, the branding and drumming out of service of two deserters from Company K. The command was formed into a hollow square facing inward. Upon the arrival of the blacksmith's forge, the deserters were partially stripped of their clothing, irons were heated, and the letter D was burnt upon their left hip. Their heads were then shaved after which they were marched about the square under guard, accompanied by a corps of buglers playing the Rogue's March. It was a humiliating and painful sight, and undoubtedly it left its salutary impression, as it was designed upon all who witnessed it. A deserter should be regarded as only next to a traitor, 
and when the military law against such offenders is enforced with becoming rigor, we will probably have fewer infractions. This part of our army discipline has thus far been evidently too loosely administered, giving occasion for demoralization. In the afternoon we enjoyed a very pleasing change of program, when true merit was rewarded. A beautiful sabre was presented by the officers of the brigade to Kilpatrick. Affairs of this kind are very much enjoyed by the major part of the command, and when night came on we all felt that today, at least, we have learned that the way of the transgressor is hard, and also that Quote, good actions crown themselves with lasting days. Who deserves well needs not another's praise. End quote. April 9. To increase the variety of our experience and to give it a pleasing tone, Kilpatrick's brigade band made its first appearance in front of headquarters this evening. They discoursed national airs in a manner that thrilled and elated us, making the welkin ring with their excellent music. As the last echoes of a plaintive air died over the distant woods, and I crept into my lowly quarters from my rest, the poet's verse seemed full of hallowed potency. Quote, music exalts each joy allays each grief expels diseases softens every pain subdues the rage of poison and of plague End quote. april eleven an exciting game of baseball was played today near our camp between boys of the fourteenth brooklyn and the harris light the contest resulted in a drawn game so that neither could claim the victory. Our time of late is slipping rapidly along. The weather is warm and beautiful, the mud is disappearing, and the flowers and birds remind us that winter is over and gone. For several weeks preparations have been evidently made for the opening of the spring campaign. Each branch of the service has been thoroughly recruited and drilled, and the entire force is computed to be at least one hundred and twenty-five thousand strong. All seem to be anxious for a good opportunity to advance upon the enemy. April 13. On the evening of the 12th, at regimental inspection, orders were received to be ready for march at daylight the next day. Consequently, Early this morning our winter quarters were abandoned, and General Stoneman, at the head of about 13,000 cavalry, took up a line of march in the direction of the upper fords of the Rappahannock, in the neighborhood of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. General Hooker's order to his cavalry chief had the ring of bright metal in it, and contained the following terse sentences, quote, let your watchword be fight, let all your orders be fight, 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 bearing in mind that time is as valuable to the Federal as the rebel authorities. It devolves upon you, General, to take the initiative in the forward movement of this grand army, and on you and your noble command must depend, in a great measure, the extent and brilliancy of our success. Bear in mind that celerity, audacity, and resolution are everything in war, and especially is it the case with the command you have, and the enterprise on which you are about to embark." End quote. We moved at a sufficient distance from the Rappahannock to screen our columns from the enemy's posts of observation. We marched to the vicinity of Elkton where we bivouacked for the night. The next morning we resumed our march and soon struck the railroad at Bealton, where we met and drove a detachment of rebel cavalry. 
After a sharp skirmish they fell back to Beverly Ford, where their crossing was covered by artillery and sharpshooters. A neat little fight enabled us to advance carbineers down to the ford, which we held, though subjected to the fire of rifled cannon on the opposite bank. At another of the numerous fords of the river, Sulphur Springs, which was not guarded, an entire division was forded across before night. But during the night a heavy rainstorm, set in a la Virginie, which so suddenly raised the stream, that the order for crossing more troops was not only countermanded, but the forces already across were ordered to return. This was not very easily done. Meanwhile, the separated division, by rapid movement and some fighting through the rain, had swung down the river to Beverly Ford, where they commenced recrossing without pontoons and with the ford unfordable. The enemy, taking advantage of this unhappy predicament, attacked the rear guard with furious determination, killing and capturing quite a number. As our artillery could not be brought into position, the only help we could afford to our unfortunate comrades was to play on the rebels with our carbines, which kept them somewhat at bay. In the haste and difficulty of crossing, where horses were compelled to swim a considerable distance through the strong current, several animals and men were drowned and borne down the stream. It was certainly a very sad experience, a disheartening commencement of operations. April 16. The Harris Light was relieved from picket and moved to Bealton, leaving Beverly Ford at four o'clock a.m. The roads are almost impassable. The rain has continued almost uninterruptedly for forty-eight hours, making our sojourn in these parts very disagreeable. But notwithstanding the mud, on the 17th a squadron of the Harris Light, composed of companies E and F, in command of Captain Charles Hasty, left our bivouac at Bealton early in the morning with instructions to proceed to Warrenton, and, if possible, to occupy the place until 4 o'clock p.m. When we had approached to within three miles of the place, the captain learned that the famous Black Horse Cavalry, under Captain Randolph, was in possession of the village, and would undoubtedly give us a splendid entertainment. The boys were unanimously pleased at the prospect of an opportunity to cross sabres with those heroes of Bull Run, and, concluding from their worldwide reputation, that nothing short of a desperate fight would ensue, we made preparations accordingly. The squadron was formed in column of platoons, and two detachments, consisting each of a sergeant and eight men, were instructed to advance upon the town from two parallel streets, thus giving our small force the appearance of being only the vanguard of a very large army. It was my privilege to command one of these detachments, and, on entering the village, we found the foe formed into line of battle on Main Street, with the apparent intention of giving us a warm reception. They had been notified of our approach by a sentinel posted in a prominent church steeple, and were therefore ready for us. We immediately drew sabres and bore down upon them with the usual yell, and, strange as it may seem to those who laud the daring of the southern black horse, they advanced to receive us, fired a few shots, unsheathed their bloodless sabres, but wheeled about suddenly and dashed away to the rear at a breakneck pace, without even halting to pay us the compliment of an affectionate farewell. Actually, it seemed as though they did not so much as look behind them, until fairly out of the range of our best carbines. 
it was quite evident to us that they agreed perfectly with that most ungallant poet who sings, quote, He who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. End quote. The beautiful and aristocratic village was now in our possession. Being informed that the proprietor of the Warrenton House was a conspicuous rebel, Captain Hasty decided to try his hospitality and sound his commissary department. Accordingly, he accosted the chivalrous gentleman and ordered a dinner for the entire squadron. When all had partaken freely of the good things provided, our rebel landlord showed signs of uneasiness in his desire to ascertain who would foot the bill. After a while, the captain politely directed him to charge it to Uncle Sam. This ended all controversy on the subject. We left Warrenton in accordance with instructions at four o'clock, and well satisfied with our excursion, rejoined the regiment during the following night. April 18. The enemy opened the ball this morning by shelling the cavalry pickets in the woods near Rappahannock Station. Under this fire we advanced some distance toward the river, and then retired slowly with a view of drawing the rebels across to our side. But they were too wily to be caught in such a trap, and our attempt failed. A stream is a great barrier between two contending forces, and no careful leader will place his men with a stream behind them unless he is quite certain of victory. We had a sad lesson of this in the Battle of Ball's Bluff. On the day following this useless cannonade, each regiment of the Corps had dress parade at six o'clock p.m. Orders from General Stoneman were read by the adjutants of their respective regiments, informing them that the entire cavalry force would move at an early hour next day. A portion of the evening was spent in preparation. However, when in the bivouac, as we have been for some time, it takes but a few moments to prepare for a move. All surplus baggage, which naturally accumulates during winter quarters, has been disposed of, either by sending it home, or to some quartermaster depot established for the purpose, as at Alexandria, or by destruction and each man carries only what little articles he can stow away in his saddle-bags and roll up in his blanket. His inventory might run as follows. A shirt, a pair of socks, and often he has only those he wears, a housewife or needle-book, paper and envelopes, a tin cup, and bag which contains his coffee and sugar mixed together. Some men carry a towel and soap. The great effort is to learn to get along with the very least possible. At first the soldier thinks he must have this article of luxury and the other, until he finds that they are positive burdens to himself and horse, and gradually he throws off this weight and that encumbrance, until his entire outfit is reduced to nearly the little end of nothing whittled to a point. Possessed of a coffee bag and cup and a hard tack or biscuit, the most essential things, he seldom now borrows much trouble about the rest of men and things. April 20. We commenced march at four o'clock this morning on the road to Sulphur Springs. Scarcely had we gone out of our bivouacs before a drenching rainstorm set in, and continued incessantly until we were forced to halt, the mud being really oceanic. The day being quite warm, we experienced but little discomfort from the wet until night. The weather then became cold, and everything being so wet, it was difficult to make fires. Consequently, we had a very tedious night. 
A fellow considered himself fortunate if, after toiling long through the cold and dark, he could succeed to cook a little coffee. But the soldier will have his coffee, if it be possible, and then he is quite contented with his lot. On the 21st, all we could do was to change our position, to get out of the very deep mud, which one night's treading of the horse's feet produced. On the following day, in the afternoon, the Cavalry Corps moved from Waterloo Bridge to Warrenton Junction. The day was pleasant, though the roads are still in a fearful condition. Our infantry is engaged in repairing the railroad to Rappahannock Station. We are evidently on the eve of some important movements. Before night, many of the boys were made glad by the reception of a large mail from the north, which is the first we have received since we left our winter quarters on the 13th instant. Nearly every man had a letter, and there was general contentment all around. The mail bag is always a welcome visitor, especially in times like this, and it is not the least of the instrumentalities which mould our character and give tone to our morale. April 23. Another drenching rain set in this morning, and continued without cessation throughout the day. We were all drowned out of our little shelter tents, and many preferred to take the chastisement face to face with the merciless elements. We were a sorry-looking company of men, drenched with the rain, bespattered with mud, and chilled with the cold. Our fires, well-nigh quenched by the falling floods, were of very little use to us. Men and horses all suffered together. Thus far the month has been very wet, and this April is certainly entitled to be classed among the weeping sisters. We spent the dreary night hoping for a better morrow. But the 24th followed the example of its predecessor, and rain poured upon us in torrents. The yielding clay of this region of country is soon trodden into a soft mud under so many hoofs, until it seems quite impossible to find a dry spot large enough to lie down upon at night. This makes our bivouacs very dreary and uncomfortable. And yet, under these melancholy circumstances, we are not totally bereft of pleasant entertainment. The woods and fields in this vicinity abound with quails and rabbits, whose presence has been the cause of some excitement and not a little fun. Ever and anon a sportive cavalier starts up a nimble rabbit and chases the frightened little creature through the camp, crying at the top of his voice, Stop him! Stop him! Catch that rabbit! etc. Poor pussy comes flying down the road, pursued by a throng of men, while the shouts are caught up and repeated along the entire line of escape, men jumping up at every bound of the animal and joining in the sport. Occasionally the rabbit is so perfectly surrounded as to be compelled at last to surrender, when the trembling prisoner is caught, but carefully treated. At this time of the year they are so very small and lean as to be scarcely eatable, and yet now and then they are shot, as well as quails, to increase our commissary supplies, and the cooks display considerable skill in dressing and preparing them a la Delmonico. April 27. Colonel Davies, after quite a lengthy absence from us, rejoined the regiment at 10 o'clock a.m., he reported having a narrow escape from guerrillas near Elkton, where he was fired at and pursued for some distance, while on his way from Falmouth. Details were ordered out immediately to those infested regions, with instructions to capture everything in the shape of a bushwhacker. 
Captain Coon of the Connecticut squadron, was put in command of the reconnoitring party. We had a rich and delightful ride, but did not succeed in overhauling the offenders. On the 28th, the 1st Battalion of the Harris Light, commanded by Captain Samuel McIrvin, was ordered to reconnoitre as far as Brentsville. We went via Elkton and Bristerburg, at which places we captured several guerrillas who were not looking for us. The first part of the day was very pleasant, but from eleven o'clock till night we had a continually drizzling rain, which made our march exceedingly disagreeable. We had but just halted for the night, when an order was received from a messenger to rejoin the regiment without delay. Through the rain, mud, and darkness, we hastened back to Catlett's Station, where we found everything in motion, preparing for some grand movement. With the gray light of the morning of the twenty-ninth, after marching most of the night, we reached the banks of the Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford. In addition to the Cavalry Corps, we found here the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac, making preparation to cross the river. The Engineer Corps soon laid the pontoons, and the Grand Columns effected a passage without material resistance or difficulty. STONEMAN'S RAID We are credibly informed that other columns of our army are crossing the river at other points, and that a great battle is imminent. There has been occasional skirmishing on the front during the day. The rebels, however, seem to have been taken wholly by surprise, and are not making the demonstrations we had good reason to anticipate but we shall be greatly disappointed if they do not soon awake and come to their work. The going is far from pleasant, though today the weather is favorable. The streams are dreadfully swollen, and nearly all bridgeless, compelling us to ford them. This process, through the cold high water, is attended with more or less difficulty and suffering. Soon after crossing the river, the Cavalry Corps broke away from the infantry in the direction of Stevensburg, and it is rumored among us that a grand raid upon the enemy's communications is contemplated. While the two armies engage in deadly combat, it is thought not far from the river. April 30. This afternoon our column reached the Rapidan at Raccoon Ford and began to cross over. The water being much above the fording mark, and very rapid, we had an exciting time. Several horses and men were swept down the stream by the swift current and were drowned, and none of us escaped the unpleasant operation of getting wet. After reaching the high plateau on the south bank of the river, the entire corps were formed in line of battle, in which hostile position we were ordered to spend the night. For more thorough protection, pickets had been set out in every direction, and posted with much care. It was a season of considerable anxiety to all, and of great fatigue especially to those of us who had been in the saddle several consecutive days and nights. Standing to horse, as we were compelled to do, very little rest could be obtained, though many were so exhausted that, dropping to the earth, with bridle and halter in hand, they fell asleep, while their comrades wished for the morning, which came at last. After our frugal breakfast, which consisted mostly of hard tack and coffee, a thorough inspection of the command was made, and all men reported to have unserviceable or unsafe horses were sent to the rear. The weather is perfectly charming today, although quite too warm in the midday heat, 
to be comfortable marching. May 2. Early in the morning our column reached the railroad in the rear of General Lee's army, and with slight opposition from their scattered pickets, the work of destruction began. Culverts and bridges, telegraph lines and posts, disappeared like the smoke of their burning. End of chapter 10, part 1